How do children perceive the world? Do you remember what it was like being a child? Were you a strange, silent child? If so, our story for this episode might resonate with you. It's Radish by Mo Yan. Our word of the day is Toming, because the Chinese title of Radish is Toming de Hong Luo Bo. But what does that mean, and why is that important? Well, you'll find out as I talk to our special guest, Lihaila. And that is her name, Lihaila, about Mo Yan, Howard Goldblatt, the Nobel Prize, politics, farming, synesthesia, windscreen wipers, and weirdness with the big W. But before all that, it's time for the Church of Fic News. Church of Fic standing for translated Chinese fiction for anyone new to the show. So the first item of the Church of Fic News is about a new book that's coming out. Cypher Press has just published a bilingual collection of poetry by Yasha called Floral Mutter. In Asia, it's available from the Chinese University of Hong Kong Press. The translator is Nick Admussen, although I've managed to write Nick, Mick, sorry, Mick Admussen in my notes, but he's definitely Nick. He's a name who popped up previously in an episode I did on weeds, aka wild grass, uh, Ye Cao by Lu Shun. Nick sent me some links where you can read interviews and excerpts of the poetry from the book, so those will all be in the show notes. I'm just going to quickly ask who is Ya Shu? Well, a math teacher by day, Ya Shu lives 1,000 miles from the Beijing literary scene, but is celebrated among lovers of Chinese poetry from the conservative to the avant garde. His jagged and intense short lyrics, wild nature sonnets, punchy couplets, and genre bending, surreal poetic essays daringly combine iconoclasm and heart. From poems about rock moths to monks to cartoon cats, his works stand outside conventional structures and forms of Chinese poetry and find their roots instead in the independent spirit, folk imagination, and tough music of the people of Sichuan. So this is um, a Sichuan poet, but working, working a very long way from the cool Beijing scene, so I'm all for that. As someone who is, myself, at this moment, quite removed from the capital of my own lands, Item two of our news today in this episode is about Chinese sci-fi. I'm sure a lot of you will be glad to hear that. So uh, the publisher Solaris are going to publish a book called Synopticon, New Chinese Science Fiction. It's an anthology a little bit kind of in the mold of Ken Leo, though the Ken Leo edited anthologies uh, Broken Stars and Invisible Planets. It's that sort of thing. But this time the translator and editor, or certainly the editor, is Shueting Christine Ni, who I've come across on Twitter a few times. This one's coming out in spring 2021. It's got world rights, so you can, um, I guess, expect this one to reach you wherever you are, and possibly in more than one language, but certainly in English. The author lineup is on the info page that Solaris uh, have put up. It's a lot of names you'll recognize from the Ken Liu anthologies. I'll just rattle through them right now. Anna Wu, Gu She, Zhao, yeah, Zhao Hai Hong, Tang Fei, Regina Kan Yu Wang, Nian Yu, Hao Jing Fang, who we've covered on the show twice, Wang Jing Kang, Ma Bo Yong, Han Song, A Q, Jiang Bo, and Bao Shu, Bao Shu, who we, we also covered on the show. He's the guy that did what has passed Shilin Kandra Light appear. So, very exciting there, and I'm working to do an interesting episode on that already, so watch this space in the publishing world and on this podcast, watch this space. The third item of the news is, again, about Chinese sci-fi. Just more and more and more of this stuff coming out, it looks like, which is great, because um, we speculated before on the show whether or not it could keep on going, and it seems like, at least in publication, it's doing that um, at present. So this is a release from Tor, who've done, at least in America, they're the kind of the publisher of translated Chinese sci-fi, and they've got a new Liu Cixin collection of short stories coming out. It's called To Hold Up the Sky. The translator is Joel Martinson, who's done more of the Liu Cixin translations than Ken Liu. So Joel Martinson seems to be 
the Leoticism translator guy um, in in the books to come. He seems to be the guy. Um, anyway, that one's coming out in October 20th, and it's as well as being a publication announcement, it was also a cover reveal. I'm not really someone who cares much about cover reveals, but I'll put a link on the show notes when you can see the cover of To Hold Up The Sky. Spoilers, it's blue and looks spacey. So um, I'm going to introduce a new segment onto the show now after this news, uh, between the news and the interview, which we are getting to, don't worry. I thought I'd put a wee segment for listener feedback where people who've got in touch with the show can kind of um, get their um, their thoughts onto the show rather than just onto my screen and then privately in my head. So we had some contact with Alec Ash, who was the translator of the Feidao story we did, um, the storytelling robot. I won't share everything he said, but basically he just said um, he's been listening to the show, he's really into it, and if any of you remember um, when my guest on uh, the episode, Matt, from the Spectology podcast, was thinking that perhaps Feidao had been a reader of Stanislaw Lem, who had written also about robots, um, Alec Ash, Feidao's translator, said he'd had the exact same thought. He asked Feidao, and Feidao said, no, um... He'd never read Stanislaw Lem's stuff. So, a bit of a surprise there, but just interesting to see how uh, Feidao and Stanislaw, without ever having read each other, had arrived at kind of similar ideas in their stories. That's pretty cool. I had a little comment on Facebook from Michelle Dieter, who's been a previous show guest, about the um, Ken Leo episode. She was just letting me know that it took her four sessions, but it was worth it. Ken's such a smart guy and it really helps me reflect on my own translation practice. So if you guys haven't listened to Ken Leo episode or the Ken Leo interview on Haljin Fan's Vagabonds, definitely do it. it is, it's a long one. It's the longest interview we've done on the podcast yet, but it's fantastic. So uh, do as Michelle did. Give that episode a listen. Another person I've been talking to through the magic of Facebook Messenger is Mingwei Song. He's a uh, probably the top academic studying Chinese sci-fi, and we just spoke on Facebook. Apparently he's been listening to the show, he's been enjoying it, and there may be something there, so watch this space. Um, And I had a couple of nice chats with show listeners on Instagram, and they were recommending me some authors I could cover. So I was talking to Sokton, that's his Instagram uh, username. He's from what I can tell, the premier translator of Chinese to Bulgarian, certainly a translator, and he was recommending the author uh, Tsan Shue, and I'm certainly very interested. I've now read one short story by Tsan Shue, and it was really something, so watch that space. And we had another bit of feedback from the listener uh, Instagram username cathode.xiong. Um, she was recommending me the Taiwanese writer Chiu Miaojin, so definitely something I'm going to look into as well. Looks like an interesting author. Thank you for the feedback, Cathode, aka Catherine, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. So yeah, thank you all, and let's get on and listen to the interview with Lihaila. Let's hear all about Radish and Moyan. Quick disclaimer, by the way, whilst I was on the line with Lihaila, I was too close to the microphone, so there was a little bit of distortion. I, whenever the volume was like really loud, I pushed it down, but that doesn't get rid of the distortion. So if my voice sounds a bit crap at points, that's why, and I apologize. But it should be listenable enough for you guys. So yeah. So I'm on the show with Lihaila Heward. Lihaila, it's great to Hello. have you on. How's your day going today? Hi, it's really great to be talking to you. Um, it's going pretty well. I've had some interesting airplane issues with the virus happening, but overall, pretty optimistic. Mm. Are you stuck somewhere? Uh, sort of. I'm still in New Zealand, but I'm trying to get to Taiwan, and it's just closed its borders. <laughs> oh, that's not so helpful. No, we'll see how it works out. Mm. I guess we should say for posterity, for any listeners listening five years in the future, this is the uh, COVID coronavirus that we're talking about. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, hopefully that won't be a forgotten in a few years, but you never know. Um, anyway, Lehila, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and then after you've told us a little bit about yourself, what the works of the author we're talking about today have to do with yourself? Yes, um, I 
am actually, you can probably tell from my voice, I'm from the U.S. I come mm-hmm. from a small rural town in Arizona called Woodruff. I started studying Chinese during my undergrad in 2008 and ended up moving to China after I graduated to teach English for a year. And then I decided that's not helping me learn Chinese. So I applied for a master's program at Northeast Normal University or Dongbei Shifan Dashie in mm. the Northeast in Changchun. Uh, I ended up spending over five years in Dongbei in the Northeast. So that's kind of my, that's where my heart is. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Pretty much. And um, it was during my MA that I started reading Mo Yan because I I was studying Chinese until I started my program. And I started my program in 2012. And that is the year that he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, with the news, I mean, I was kind of just hopping on the bandwagon, you could say, because I originally wanted to study Northeast literature or Dongbei Wenxue. Mm. But um, I didn't even get too far in before he won the Nobel, and that drew me to reading his works. And I just thought, oh, he's fantastic. I I better study him. This is so relevant. So I um, mm. went to my supervisor. My supervisor said, great, you can tell us how Americans view Moyen. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, <laughs> there you go. Mm. Um, I just learned in my research for this episode where Moyan's from. So he's not a Dongbei guy, but no. I guess he's, depending on where you draw the line, he's arguably a, a northern Beifang guy because he's from oh, he's Shandong, right? a Beifang guy, yeah, absolutely. And there's actually, it's, um, historically, Shandong has a very intricate and close relationship with Dongbei because Shandong is just south of the, the pass, the Guanhai Pass. Mm, Shanghai Guan. Yeah, and then the uh, northeast is, of course, northeast of it. And before the, or during the Qing dynasty, especially the early years, um, no Han Chinese people were allowed past the Shanghai Pass. Um, But then because of Russian encroachment, the Qing dynasty started to send people, and they mostly sent people from Shandong. So the Mm. great majority of Han uh Han Minzu people in Dongbei today, they are of Shandong, like a heritage originally. Right. Ah, I did not know that. I knew yeah. I knew about the um like the like that Dongbei being a an enclave of the Manchu or being a no Han zone and I know it got repopulated because of the Russians, but I didn't know it was by Shandong people. So that's yeah, interesting. Mostly. Yeah, it is quite interesting. So there's a lot of cultural resonance, I think, that I can see in Moyen's work. Hmm. Um, I occasionally throw in a little anecdote about my time living in China on the show, and I think this one's too good not to mention. Yeah. When you said Shanghai Guan, um, brought back a lot of memories because I I went there at the end of my first year in China. My mum wanted me to basically give me a tour and see. I think she wanted to see absolutely everything, and I had to clarify: it's a big country, you can't see everything. But um, <laughs> what the thing she was most keen on was the wall. But she doesn't like crowds, so she actually mm-hmm. herself found like some alternative Great Wall spots to visit. Yeah. And she's always like beach holidays. So she thought, oh, Sh- Shanghai Guan, the place where the wall meets the sea. Perfect. So we, we went there yeah. and we sat on that beach beneath the wall. Um, although the, that stretch of wall looks like it was, re- I think it was rebuilt in like the 90s or something. So she was mm-hmm. a bit shocked it wasn't tumbly down and authentic looking. But yeah. It so, is an exciting place to stand though, just because you then imagine mm-hmm. thousands of miles west, there's another point that's the end of the wall. Mm-hmm. Well, another anecdote I'll say much more quickly. Um, I've been to, and I don't know if it's the other end, another end, uh, where the wall uh, almost, well, it kind of reaches right to the edge of the border with North Korea, and you can see into the North, uh, in North Korea from there. And oh, those are the only two yes. bits of the wall I've been to, weirdly. The, yes. <laughs> the strange. Uh, the, the end, uh, I think that one's in Dandong, right? Yeah, just outside Dandong. Mm hmm. Yeah, I've been there as well, and I I really quite like Dandong because of its mm. proximity to North Korea. Yeah, interesting place. Um, yeah, we could probably absolutely. talk about Dandong for the next hour, but we should. Oh, I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Um, and Dongbei. Um, but we've got to talk about this Beifang guy, not uh, not any Dongbei guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. It's it's pretty exciting to have you on the show, uh, being a, an academic sort of person. And we have had academics on before, but I've never really focused on them as academics. We had um, mm-hmm. 
Liu Guan Zhao, who's doing his PhD at, uh, I think it's King's College London, but I was kind of talking to him as one of the two organizers of the London Chinese sci-fi group. And we had uh, Christopher Payne and Nathaniel Isaacson on, both academics, but I was talking to them as translators of the stories we were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, Empires of Dust um, by Zhang Zilong and The mm -hmm. Fundamental Nature of the Universe by Han Song. But this time, you're not the translator of Mo Yan. It's, it's somebody <laughs> else. So we're... It's true. We have the opportunity to get a bit more academic. We'll, we'll see if we do. Um, yeah. Yeah. On, on that note, um, the first questions I want to ask you are kind of like questions about um, your studies. So, so you kind of told me already that what your first contact with Chinese literature, language, Chinese things was. Um, was that something you wanted to do a long time or was it happenstance or somewhere in between? Uh, I would say kind of somewhere in between. I was an English literature major during my undergrad years. Uh, but it seemed very natural to then move into Chinese literature if I wanted to become fluent in Chinese and also wanted to do a master's in China in Chinese. So it's kind of a natural progression, I would say. Plus, mm -hmm. I think that um, the more... I, I can't really say that I have read widely, um, so I don't know if I'm the best person to say this, but I do think that learning literature is just such a good way to get into the heart of a society and mm -hmm. a culture or multiple cultures because I, I if there's anything I've learned <laughs> from studying Chinese literature it's that um, despite what some people think it is very regional and absolutely apart from regional there there's also the the genre issue and the different writers that are doing different things plus there's you know I'm I kind of consider myself more a historian these days. And I think there's also, you know, a huge thing to say, or there's a lot to say about historic, um, historical fiction, but also the, the different types of literature you see throughout the 20th century in China. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, it's, it's much more involved than I think um, English readers know. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Nothing, nothing exists in a vacuum, especially not such a oh, massive yeah. country. It would be Absolutely. crazy. I do wonder if it's like growing up with the idea of the Great Wall. Like when I was wee, I don't know if my parents told me or if my child brain just jumped to this conclusion, but I thought the Great Wall went exactly around the border of China. And <laughs> once you know a little bit about China, you know about how insane or, you know, <laughs> that idea is. <laughs> That's actually a really interesting one. I think I probably thought something like that when I was young as well. Um, and considering that... Uh, China's borders have been they they've fluctuated <laughs> mm -hmm. for centuries it would be kind of crazy if that were the case although it makes sense because a lot of cities are actually surrounded by walls in China mm. yep yeah. um so the next question I've got it's another sort of origin story question um you've also you've already said kind of how you ended up studying Mo Yan it was kind of a reaction to him getting the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. um but like was it just the fact that he was suddenly a big name or was there something else that kind of drew you in? I, I don't think I would have chosen to study him if I hadn't read his works. So I chose to read him because he won the Nobel. I might not have heard of him otherwise mm. um, because I was interested more in uh, historical matters. <laughs> um, but once I started reading him, I was completely drawn in. He just creates this world and these just this picture <laughs> and his narrative voice I just yeah I completely was entranced so that's mm -hmm. kind of what made me think oh uh, it would be really good to to delve into his works more and I know there's at the time I was just thinking oh I have because I started by reading um the translation Shifu you'll do anything for a laugh which mm. is a translation of Shifu ni yue la yue xiao um mm. or no, no. Ni yue la yue yue mo. But uh, yeah. he, yeah, that's just a short story collection. And I love short stories. And I just figured, oh, his novels must be even more involved and more interesting. So, mm. yeah. And our, our book for today, I suppose it's not quite a short story. It's maybe more of a pretty small novella, but it's it's a short a short piece. Um, It's Radish or 
uh, to ming de hong lo bo in, in Chinese. So I'd like to ask you about, about Radish. Um, when did you read it in your kind of Moyan uh, journey? And like as a, as a reader, how did you react to it? And as an academic, how have you kind of dealt with it or considered it or whatever the right verb is? Um, I maybe... I shouldn't admit this, but I actually read Radish for the first time for this show. Oh, yes. So you did. <laughs> and, and, but here's the thing. I knew it was significant because it was his first, uh, it was his start as an author. It's sort of what um, launched him into the, you know, in people's purview. But mm. it was only translated recently and it wasn't a part of my scope when I was researching him. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, this the the edition that we're looking at was published in 2015 and i finished my ma in 2015 so right. yeah it just it just wasn't on my mind at that point mm -hmm. mainly because like i said i was you know per my supervisor's request i was looking at how specifically americans viewed moyen which meant i i made the decision early on that that meant looking more at the translations in english mm -hmm. rather than the originals because it wasn't a comparative thesis it was really looking at the um the types of reactions both scholarly and not scholarly that the translations had received so right. it was about reception Okay. Um, what you said about the, the kind of gap between publication in Chinese and publication in English. So it's I'm, I'm holding my little Penguin Specials, Penguin uh, China Specials edition of, of Radish, mm -hmm. which I think is the... When you read it just for this show, did you read this edition or did you read the Chinese? I read both, actually. I got about ah, halfway right. through the Chinese version, but I had to hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so... So hurried and went back to the English version and read that. Um, okay, cool. Partly yeah. as a way to just see how I felt reading both, mm. um, and if I got any deep, uh, different impressions from reading them. Okay. And I uh, do think it was the Penguin version. That's, I mean, it's the uh, the ebook, but it is the Penguin version. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So I've got the same edition, but uh, on paper, and it, it's got here a uh, text copyright Moyan 2015, translated from the Chinese by Howard Goldblatt, who we are going to talk about certainly. And then mm -hmm. it says uh, originally published in Chinese as Tong Ming De Hong Luo Bo by the Chinese Writers Magazine, 1985. So a 30-year gap there. And yeah. am I right in thinking if this one came out 2015, that's three years after he got the Nobel Prize? Is that right? Yep, that is. I can't remember the exact month, but yes. Right. And as well, far as I know, he had, right after he won the Nobel, that's when the translation of Sandalwood Death came out. That's a big epic novel of his. And then soon after that, Frog was also published, the translation mm. Frog. Um, and then as far as I know, he had a bit of a gap where he was just kind of lying low. And then he started doing some plays. But right. I actually hadn't heard about this translation of Radish coming out. I didn't, mm. yeah, I, it's, I, somehow I missed it. Went under the radar. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to pause here. Um, I, when I picked up the book, I lost the place that I marked. Um, oh, no. So I'm going to edit this gap out. Cool. That's cool. Oh, there it is. Is it okay. actually 65 pages? Um, this edition? Uh, My edition is more than that. It's um, if you don't include the like adverts and stuff at the end, eighty six. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, right. Next question about your studies. This is kind of like a bonus fun question. Um, what's been the most surprising thing you've learned along the way on your academic journey? In my thesis, the conclusion that I came to was that there were a lot of different opinions on Moyen. And of course, that makes sense when it's different opinions among scholars. I didn't realize there would be such a big divide between scholars who considered him, um, or, or, or let's say scholars who thought highly of him, and then scholars who kind of denounced him in public for not being a dissident against the Chinese government mm -hmm. or against the PRC, I didn't realize there would be such a big gap where that was concerned. And that disappointed me a little bit, to be honest. I thought, I thought uh, 
that especially considering that he had won the Nobel, that more Chi- scholars of China or Sinologists would be just quite happy. Um, but that really wasn't the case. <laughs> so that was right. surprising. And then the other surprising thing was just how big of a gap there was between um, just his... Well, the other thing that surprised me was that I just, I saw that there was a really big gap between how scholars believed translations should be interpreted or uh, perceived or even received and how actual people on the ground received them. And I didn't really expect that either. There just seemed to not be any um, agreement on the significance of translation as a whole. And I just thought that was really interesting, considering that Howard Goldblatt, the translator, is a scholar by training as well. So, uh, yeah, that surprised me. Yeah. And I think that um, there, there really could be more comparative study and more focus on him in world literature, but like in order to make that significance uh, about the translations more profound. But, um, you know, we'll see if that happens. To me, it really raises questions about the relationship between context and form, Mm -hmm. which I like thinking about. (laughs) Yeah, something I really mean to do uh, is to like learn about the effectiveness or not of uh, translations or to learn about which China books are interesting to or translated Chinese books are interesting to English language readers is just Mm. to like trawl through Goodreads reviews or Amazon reviews because yeah, as fascinating as it is to hear theories from translators or people who are kind of self-styled China hands or China experts or whatever, what what they tell you about how things should be could have absolutely no bearing on how readers uh, enjoy or don't enjoy the books. Yes, um, that's what I found so, yeah. as well. I also <laughs> trolled through Goodreads reviews a lot, <laughs> included many in my thesis. Um, and yeah, mm-hmm. I, I absolutely did find that. I think, I mean, we'll probably end up talking about this more, but there's there's certainly a question of, about to what extent does a translated author represent their country or their culture at, as a whole? Right. And I think that a lot of people do <clears throat> approach translated literature in order to get a better picture of a society mm-hmm. or culture. I mean, I've done that for sure. Um, and I think a lot of people do that consciously without really being aware of the implications. Um, and I think that's really the issue is, is are they, are we aware when we do that of the implications? Are we really going to learn what we think we're going to learn? <laughs> yeah. I've, um, I came across a little bit of, um, criticism of that approach when I was doing my, uh, dissertation uh, which mm. my master's dissertation which was on chinese sci-fi but also looked in general at translated chinese stuff and um like i think the funniest uh, critique of, of, of that i read was something like there'll be like blurb quotes on a yan li and ke book um saying it's a vivid picture of modern china ignoring yes. the fact that yan li and ke is a surrealist writer who writes absurd scenes that could never happen in reality <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah um mm-hmm. Yep, and you, you reminded me actually of when you're talking about the criticism um, Moyan's received. Um, so when I was doing a little bit of reading on the same sort of topic, and a familiar name popped up, a uh, kind of name I've mentioned before on the show all the way back when I did uh, an episode on the poet Juju, whose book uh, The Wild Great Wall got brought out by a little non-profit publisher in, I think, LA, or maybe San Francisco. I think mm-hmm. San Francisco. Um what they called phoneme phoneme media and they do lots of uh, world poetry so poetry from lots of different places and languages and i was looking through their list to see if they had any other chinese books and they, they whether or not they did or they didn't is a bit subjective because they had uh, a book called the farthest exile uh, no, uyghur land the farthest exile um oh, wow. poems translated from uyghur and arabic into english and I think the translator was a guy called Jeffrey Yang. And I thought, oh, okay. Jeffrey Yang. Okay, Yang, probably a Chinese name. And then his name never really popped up again, unlike a lot of other names I've I've kind of come across for this show and as a reader. But yeah, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Yang it seems to be, I don't know, at least in the world of Mo Yan, what he's famous for is being one of two prominent people who had a pop at Mo Yan. Um, I think not either when he was winning the Nobel or not long after, precisely for saying this guy is a stooge because he's not calling for the downfall of the Chinese government. Right. I think I might remember that name now that Mm -hmm. you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of articles like that at the time. Mm -hmm. A lot. Yeah. 
Um, there was also a gap. I don't know if this is something that people are aware of, but there was a there was actually a really big gap in anything published in public about Moyen. There was like a bunch of scholarship in the early 90s, basically between 1989 and 1993, 94, and then nothing until he won the, uh, the Nobel. And then after that, there was a whole slew of mostly news articles, of course, and mm. almost nothing uh, scholar-wise or nothing in academic journals, really. So it was just kind of strange, like just a, a big gap where there were a bunch of translations happening during that time, which is pretty interesting, but nothing being written about those translations. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. We, we might get a bit more onto like uh, the publicity Mo Yan Scott outside of China when we get on to talking about Howard Goldblatt. But um, right. for now, I'd like to talk about the big man himself, uh, Mo Yan. So this isn't one of the questions I prepared, but I think this would be a, a fun thing to mention. Um, Mo Yan is his pen name right? Mm, yes. And wh what does it mean? Can you tell uh, the listeners who don't know? Moyen means, you could translate it as don't speak or can't speak. It just basically means no language. Right. And do you know why? Well, I, I know, but um, I'm wondering if you can <laughs> tell the listeners where he got that one from. Uh, yeah. So the story goes, and it is a bit of a, a myth at this point, <laughs> mm. But the way he tells it is that he was a very, very, very talkative child, and he was um, just kind of constantly getting on everybody's nerves. <laughs> and his mom would ca often tell him, I think it's also important to remember that he grew up in the 1950s. Yes. Um, so this is the time of the Great Leap Forward, and then in the uh, 60s, the Cultural Revolution. So he grew up in this very uh, sensitive, politically sensitive time and his mom would often tell him you need to you know not speak as much you're going to get yourself in trouble <laughs> so he when he started writing um kind of in honor of her or an ode to her he gave himself the pen name moyen mm. it's funny that um he was so talkative because yeah. the the little boy who's possibly to some extent a version of Moyan, uh, the little boy in Radish. He's not talkative at all, but he is also right. constantly getting in trouble, whether or not he wants yeah, to. Yeah, mm. that occurred to me as well as I read it, um, partly because Moyan has said in um, many times in different speeches and written it that, hey, hi, the, the boy, the character that you're talking about, is probably the best reflection of his soul that he's come up with. Yeah, um, there's a little quote on the front of this Penguin book. It says, that dark-skinned boy with a superhuman ability to suffer and a superhuman degree of sensitivity represents the soul of my entire fictional output. So, yeah. not his self per se, but his, his output. But I mm. guess those two things both have a lot of soul. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and it is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, our, our young man, Hei Hai, is in the county of Gaomi, which is... I'm not sure if I've got the tones right, but Gaomi. Um, and that's an important place to Moyan as well. Can you tell the mm. listeners why that is? Uh, Gaomi is um, a township, like you said, basically a county in East Shandong province. Um, it's where he is from. That's where the author is from. And it's where he sets all of his stories. Uh, so it's important simply because it's his hometown. But that fact has also led many people to discuss Moyen in terms of native place literature and um, root-seeking literature, which are very similar, mm. but not quite the same, I suppose. Um, native place literature would be pretty significant because the idea is that uh, as you write about the the region or the actual place, what you do is project your regional characteristics onto the national landscape. So in other words, you recast what would otherwise be peculiarities as national characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of authors have done that in a lot of different time periods, but there uh, it was talked about for quite a while in the 1920s and 30s, and then sort of brought back to life in the 1980s. And Moyen was one of the forerunners of that. Mm, just going to say, in, in the 80s, would that be one of the various literary reactions to like the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution? Yes, absolutely. And root seeking kind of uh, kicked that off. So the idea right. behind root seeking is that uh, in the Cultural Revolution and before that, during the Great Leap Forward, so much was really uh, like so much 
traditional damage. culture. Yeah, damage was done to traditional culture and also traditional sensibilities. So the idea behind root seeking literature is these writers had space um, and political, relative political freedom to explore what their actual roots were, um, both in terms of their, like where they came from, because you know, there were a lot of, there was a whole generation that had been uprooted to go to work in other places in the country, right? The the sent-off mm. youth. Um, yep. Moyen was, as far as I remember, and you might correct me, he was not a sent-off youth. Not that I'm aware he, of, but I'm far from an yeah. expert. Well, there no, were a lot of sent-off youth army. who was, who they, sorry? <laughs> he joined, I, think, I think in that period of his life, he joined the army rather than being sent anywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. And there are a lot of, um, there were a lot of writers who were sent-off youth who then began writing as a way to reconnect with where they came from. Um, and part of with where they came from was also talking about you know that their relationship with the land relationship with culture tradition things that had perhaps been covered over during the turbulent years mm. um just to plug a couple past episodes of the show i don't think we've done any root seeking literature per se um we've definitely done some did what did you call it local place place uh, native place literature native Place, yeah. Um, if anyone's interested in something that's really about native place, um, the episode I did on Feng Chitai's um, Faces in the Crowd, mm. I would recall the Chinese name, uh, but it's gone. But anyway, uh, the episode Xiang on Faces... Yeah. Right. Oh, sorry, probably for the book. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I think you helped me. That was the one where the literal translation was something like um, oh, yes. strange people in a vulgar world, or unusual people in a ordinary world something like that well that that's um, about it's about the people of the place but it really tells you about the place and the place is old colonial uh, tianjin and we've got another um one which is kind of about relationship to the land but it's like another uh, genre of fiction that was reacting reacting to the cultural revolution um it's empires of dust nong ming di guo nong min di guo by jiang Zilong. Um, I think I do know the Chinese name. Oh no, I just said the Chinese name for that one. I also know the Chinese name for the genre. I think it's a Gaigo and Shui, reform literature. Mm -hmm. So um, if anyone listening wants to hear more about styles of Chinese novel or fiction or writing that came after the Cultural Revolution, those two episodes are fun places to go. Yeah, I'm going to keep rambling on, um, listeners, because there's another thing I'd like to plug. Um, if you've not heard before, this podcast has its own little map, uh, like a custom Google map that I'll link to in the show notes um, and tweet about and whatnot. It's got um, basically every setting of every book that we cover, I place on a Google map and you can look at them all together. And I've placed Gaomi, um, Gaomi County, Moyan's kind of birthplace and hometown on the map for you guys to enjoy. And I think uh, Lihaila has something to say about Gami, if I'm right. Uh, yes, it might. Well, it might do better somewhere else. But um, the one of the prominent Chinese scholars of Moyen, uh, Zhang Qinghua, he says that um, Gaomi Township and also the world of Red Sorghum or the world of the Red Sorghum family is, um, you know, it's it's Moyen's earth. And he's just very connected to this earth that he creates. So these places really carry and they're sort of symbolic of his whole world view. Mm. That's kind of, uh, it's an important thing because he like, this is, this is where he draws the significance for himself as an author and also for every story that he writes. Right. Thank you for, thank you for um, chipping in with that. That's um, probably going to inform our discussion about, uh, Radish. No, you've already told me that Radish was kind of like the start of his career, the first uh, big thing he got published. So yes. uh, I'm going to extend the the question and just ask, like, compared to his other writing, where does it sit? Because this is the only Moyan I've read. Um, this is my intro to him. Oh, this How is similar or not? This was one of the questions I was really excited for, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's I, so as someone who has read a lot of his stories, especially the ones in translation, I found this to be really different. However, I knowing that it 
was his first, basically, I consider it, you know, speaking of roots, as the root of all of those other stories. And I could see very clearly how he's developed as an author and as an artist. Because, for example, Sandalwood Death, which um, I would consider kind of the epitome of his style is I can just see how it progressed from radish to sandalwood death. And I think any reader who, who has read maybe at least three of the works in between those two will probably see something very similar. Um, but I can also like form when I first came to radish and started reading it, I kind of felt like it was really toned down and it was quite, um, yeah, it was very, odd because it wasn't as crazy the 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 energy in it wasn't as high strung <laughs> maybe mm. i don't mean high strung but just his other novels are very high energy and they're very quick pace mm -hmm. and i kind of could almost feel that in radish but not quite so it just felt a lot more slow than the rest of the works so i think a reader coming into it with no knowledge would just you know, would find it just a great novel. But anybody who has already read, for example, Red Sorghum or um, Life and Death are Wearing Me Out, that he would come to Radish and be like, well, where's all the crazy stuff? <laughs> right. I, yeah. I, my experience of reading it, that finding that it was not not a tense book, let's say, that matches well, what you said matches exactly my experience of reading it. Um, I'll try and paint a picture of how, how I read the bulk of this book. Um, so I picked it up um, on a trip to London, it was uh, a trip I had to, was on a wee holiday, travelling holiday of sorts in the south of England after having finished my dissertation. Uh, stopped by London, um, did a little meeting of sorts, and I also swung by the Guanghua Bookshop, um, the kind of Chinese bookshop in Chinatown. Yeah. And came back from that, put it on my bookshelf, didn't touch it for a few months, was reading other things. And then around like Christmas and New Year, um, me and a couple of my friends uh, went up to um, my friend Tim's house. Tim lives in this place called Blair Gowrie, which is north of Dundee. Dundee's on a river, but you don't have, and it's certainly not like the highlands of Scotland, but you don't have to go too far north before you're getting into like the highlands and the mountains and glens and stuff. Mm. And I, I learned ever since my pal moved to Blair Gowrie, you can take one of just like the city buses and you can get up there in about half an hour, but on like a generic bus and even double decker ones um go up that way so um i think i went up with my pals but they had to go like on the evening or you know, they were stay the night but i stayed the night up at my pal's house at the top of this glen not reading the book obviously and the morning after i was quite hungover in kind of like a hazy i don't know if, if you if you know that feeling when you're a little bit hungover but you all you can do is just lie back and recover and relax <laughs> So I was in that sort of liminal state, uh, catching, went, got driven down into Blair Gallery Town, uh, caught the bus back into Dundee. So I sat myself up on the uh, the top level, got the nice seats at the front where you have like a widescreen view of everything in front of you. <laughs> so I was seats. seeing, yeah, yeah, so I was seeing the Scottish far land, farmland pass in front of me, just sat on my own, uh, pulled out radish and just kind of read it in this like hazy state. That kind of matched the hazy weather outside reading about this boy tramping about in the local stream looking at the fish's whiskers and yeah it, i wouldn't describe I think it that's as the like perfect a perfect setting to read radish mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's been great books i've read where i've been in the wrong headspace and haven't enjoyed them and yes. there's been other books i've read where this the, just the situation the context that i'm reading it in and the state of mind are perfect and then i end up thinking it's a work of genius but it's been multiplied <laughs> by whatever situation I picked the book up in, if that makes sense. Mm, it does. It, it makes perfect sense. And I, I kind of had the opposite uh, experience with this book because maybe it was because I hadn't read it before, but I was, um, I struggled sometimes to get into the headspace. And it was interesting because it reminded me, it took me back to the times when I was reading the books for the, um, during my master's. And I, remember very distinctly being in my dorm room and reading maybe let's say half a chapter and I'm I'm a very fast reader but I could only mm. get through about half a chapter in a, in any given Moyen book because of how intense it was right <laughs> he uh, it's very 
very intense, especially Life and Death are Wearing Me Out and um, Sandal of Death. I would say those two are probably the most intense. And um, I remember just having to put the book down and being like, okay, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and maybe it could it could last for a day or two and then come back to it because I would have to really um follow every single sentence and allow myself to truly enter into the character's world and I found that in radish as well there were times when I could just and this happened in Chinese as well I would just skim over things not even skimming I felt like I was reading and then I would stop and go wait did I even mm. take in any of that and I'd go back and I'd like, I would say I kind of would dive in and it felt as if I would have to start walking along the bridge with him, for example, um, or right. like the scene at the end when, um, when the blacksmith is walking along the bridge, I, I really had to get into his shoes and kind of wobble around with him. Um, or when Hey Hai was kind of crawling through the, the jute stocks i i would really have to like get down on the ground figuratively with him to follow where the story was going and also just follow every description because that's how rich moyen's language is he's constantly describing every single sound and feeling and touch and color just i mean it's constant yeah and in the hands of a bad writer that could be very annoying and distracting it could but, Absolutely. but it, it works here and at least in the Howard Goldblatt's translation I've read it, it definitely works it's very immersive mm -hmm. and poetic mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so that kind of leads us to the next question about Moyan um you sometimes hear his work uh, described as magical realism and I think in there's a a, a term in the kind of reason the Nobel Literature Prize Committee gave uh, for awarding him his prize, they they use the phrase hallucinatory realism, mm. and that seems to get quoted a lot. So, do you think magical realism and hallucinatory realism are good uh, a good description a of Moyan's work in general, and b are they a good description of radish? I personally don't like the connotations of hallucinatory realism. I feel like even though a hallucination is when you see something that's not real <laughs> i feel like it's just too tied up with um the imagination and well that doesn't quite sound right i it's a little bit too tied up with drugs for one thing <laughs> yeah like western and so, and, 60s, 70s right and also psychosis i think mm -hmm. so it to me the connotation is you have this reality and everybody around you knows that it's real but you yourself are somehow not uh, equipped to handle it. And I don't feel like that's a good description of Moyen's work. So I, anyway, I don't really like that term, but I, um, I'm i okay with magical realism. And in fact, if you had asked me this five years ago, I would have said, absolutely, I love the term magical realism because it was new to me back then. And right. when I first started reading Moyen, I also started looking out for anything else that was magical realism and I would find everything or I would I found <laughs> a lot and I liked all of it. So I was just very much into that term at that time. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know if it's, quite what I would call radish and I don't know if it's quite what I would call his works now five years later <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. partly because I have I've learned a little bit more about magical realism in the scholarly sense and I I now understand that it's not really just a descriptive term towards the the literature itself um but it's more a, an analytical framework at least from scholarly from the scholarly point of view right and scholars tend to use it more associating it with post-colonialism and trauma especially collective or national mm -hmm. so they they argue in many cases and it it does tend to be for um developing countries like literature from developing countries not mm -hmm. so much from the 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 typical or the not really so much from the western or, or white canon i would even dare say right <laughs> it, yeah. they tend to use it more about um literature coming from people of color or from other like developing countries especially south america or central america mm -hmm. and with uh moyen china gets included in that 
partly because he himself had, you know, he he considers himself quite inspired by Gabriel Mar- uh, Garcia Marquez or mm-hmm. Gabriel. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it makes sense, but I think that it's kind of taken it maybe a bit too far sometimes. Um, mm. I can see where that reading comes from, but I personally am more of the mind to talk about authors as individuals. Um, and I know their social environments are very important, but I think that especially when we're talking about a translation, we should probably be very wary of projecting meaning onto a collective that, uh, quote unquote, we might not understand. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I do say that with a grain of salt, but I, I think that these are questions that um, readers should probably be aware of, but also probably especially anybody who's going to go and analyze the work really should be aware of. So I think that mm-hmm. magical realism and other analytical frameworks can be problematic when they're coming from a Western background, but Chinese scholars have also really connected with that interpretation. So what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yeah. really sure what the right answer is there, or if there is a right answer. Um, for example, I was that article that I was talking about, uh, written by Zhang Qinghua, in that he calls Mo Yen an Adonis. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> what do you do with that? <laughs> Whatever you like, I suppose. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, a couple wee anecdotes about magical realism. One's like about the amazing uh, opinions, let's say, that you see on Twitter. Um, and I, I quite like Twitter. It's done wonders for the mm. show, and it's how we've ended up um, communicating. Yes. But um, speaking of taking things with a pinch of salt, um, I saw someone, some tweet on there that was getting lots of retweets, and it was very popular. And it was their um, uh, opinion, this this user's opinion about magical realism, which basically said, listen, if you um, call anything that's not from South American magical realism, then you are part of the problem. And like, right. obviously the sentiment there is pointing out this person knows that the genre emerged in South America, but this person presumably isn't aware of Moyan and the ways mm. that that kind of seed of literature has spread throughout the world. Um, right. And that reminds me, um, in the episode on Empires of Dust, which is not a magical realist book, but has a few moments that you might call magical realist, um, I ended up talking, having a somewhat similar conversation with uh, the a translator and academic Christopher Payne and there was mm-hmm. a phrase that stuck in my head um, which was the, the kind of the, the way that magical realism was transmitted from uh, South America to China kind of sidestepped the Anglosphere that's the phrase it sounds very corny but it's I think it's a, a useful one um, and it that is an ma- interesting thought yeah yeah I, I mean it, I'm not sure if it's completely accurate but what I have found which I kind of knew living in China but didn't really have a full understanding of but something i've really seen on this podcast is that um chinese readers they a they read an awful lot of um translated stuff stuff that's been translated into um chinese and it seems like a lot of it is probably the majority of it is from european languages but not not necessarily english uh there's a lot of stuff from russian a lot of stuff from south america but also huge amounts of french spanish Mm -hmm. german So, like, it's not something I'm an expert on at all, but thinking about, like, the influence of Western or European languages or literature in China, it's huge, but it doesn't have much of a bias at all towards English. I mean, English might be the biggest out of the lot, but I'm sure English is outnumbered by everything else stacked against it, if that makes sense. It does, it does, and I noticed that as well. Um, But I would say that when it comes to magical realism, There are some arguments out there that talk about how um, it's really less a matter of influence and more a matter of similarities in terms of like um, folklore and not really the content of folklore, but the fact of folklore. So Mm. a lot of people, a lot of scholars, I should say, they uh, and especially Chinese scholars, they will talk about how what Moyen is really tapping into is the is a sense of tradition. And he and he says it himself. He grew up listening to um, master storytellers, you know, master bards, so to speak. Uh, he mm. talks about one, I don't remember the name of him, but he talks about this one that would tell stories in the marketplace every day, or at least some maybe at least once a week and Moyen himself as a kid would just 
run there every time the man was performing so that he could go and and watch just avidly <laughs> and practically mm. memorize everything that the storyteller himself would have to say. So, you know, he talks about his inspiration largely coming from these folk tales. And I, I can really see that in Radish. I wasn't so sure when I was reading the other books, but I feel like Radish, um, and maybe it's just because of the the distance I have now from the other books, but I definitely sensed the closeness uh, of those folk traditions and folk tales in the telling of this story, especially in mm. the rendering of the landscape. I could really feel like t there were a couple of parts that reminded me of shadow plays. Right. And just that kind of wispiness or that wispy mm. quality, that kind of uh, whimsical quality as well. And how you you get a clear picture, you know exactly what's happening in the story. You're really completely entranced by it. But at the same time, it's uh, it's floating kind of in your vicinity but you can't quite uh touch or grasp it mm -hmm. yeah I, that's what it made me think of in many moments <laughs> floating is a great word um for for this book or this story um mm -hmm. speaking of magic and kind of master storytellers i i forget which um piece of reading i was doing as prep but i read somewhere that one of the influences on moyan was a uh, pu song ling strange tales from a chinese studio and mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've been recommended that book before. Whenever I express interest in kind of strangeness in stories, Chinese stories, someone will always point me towards that one. So right. this this might come up later when we're talking about the story itself, but um, probably this is a, a book I really should do a future episode on. But anyway, um, I'm going to stop rambling on here about this, that and the other and, and Mo Yan and move on to the next topic. Because when it comes to talking about Mo Yan in like a C to E, Chinese to English context, or even just talking about his reception outside of China, there's another name that's not far off and it's Howard Goldblatt. He's known um, as the Jay-Z of his field on this podcast because of um, something <laughs> translator Dylan Levi King said that made me chuckle on the episode he was on. Um, so... Yeah, if Howard Goldblatt is Jay-Z, I don't know what that would make Mo Yan, but um, anyway. I was thinking about that question, actually, and I would say maybe something like Bobby Brown. <laughs> yeah, my first thought was Beyonce, but that obviously doesn't work <laughs> at all on any level. I was thinking so. something like Bobby Brown because, um, well, I was just thinking maybe the whole idea of, the, <clears throat> of rap maybe coming from, um, like, the... Oh. The Roots. The Roots. What's that label that was really famous that did everybody jackson five and bobby rogers all of them uh, i don't know ah uh, anyway yeah i <laughs> see what you're days. going for right the motown Motime. days yeah yeah more anyway. the more town <laughs> yeah <laughs> there we go um that's that'll go down in show history more time um yeah that's awesome so i want to talk about mr how go when aka uh howard goldblatt um he was the translator of another book uh, covered on the show, just on the very second episode, I think. Um, uh, Please Don't Call Me Human by Wang Shuo. Um, and I, however, go, but I didn't know who he was. He was just a name when I did that episode. Oh. He totally avoided scrutiny. Because I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, things have changed a lot since I started the show, but this has been going from knowing nothing to knowing at least something. So yeah, he really <laughs> was just a name when I picked up that book despite reading his intro and reading his intro at the time i thought oh this guy seems to like have a little bit of a sense of humor he seems to have done a competent translation mm -hmm. and yeah it's just funny knowing that in hindsight who this guy is that is quite funny <laughs> so yeah it's time for him to get scrutinized on the show for the very first time or maybe okay. technically the second time because me and dylan talked about him so can you tell us or tell the listeners why mr Howard Goldblatt and Mr. Moyan are somewhat tied together, at least in the popular imagination. Howard Goldblatt is one of many Moyens, so to speak. Uh, that that phrasing comes from his own article that was written uh, post Nobel win, where he was discussing the uh, Moyens other, or sorry, yeah, Moyens other Moyens, <laughs> basically yeah. the translators from other languages. Um, but for English readers, he is you know, uh, the the only one, as far as I know, that has translated Moyen. But he's also translated a wide array of literature, um, and and that has verified his reputation among Chinese scholars, despite 
I think, being the only person to translate Moyen into English. Mm. I, for me personally, I was, I took it as a sign from the universe to find out that uh, Howard Goldblatt kind of started his career out by rediscovering the author Xiao Hong because Xiao Hong, she's a, a Dongbei author and mm. probably the most well known. And I didn't realize, like, I had heard of her before I heard of Howard Goldblatt, but I didn't realize that he had been the one to research her work and translate it. And that kind of put her back into the purview of Chinese scholars. I did not realize that. So when I found that out, I was like, oh, I'm, <laughs> you know, he has a connection to Dongbei and I eventually want to come back around and research Dongbei. So yes, this is, this is a sign that I need to be <laughs> researching Moyen for now. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, I mean, he has a very broad CV in terms of translating Chinese literature. He trans, he's translated quite a bit from Taiwanese authors and yeah, like you said, Wang Shuo and just many, many others. Um, <clears throat> I think there's something to be said for how marketable his translations are, considering that most translated fiction has only come to light in the last 20 years or so. Uh, that's something that I didn't realize before researching this either but i i really think that there's a lot that's been discussed on this podcast that are very recent translations absolutely and yeah. um throughout the 90s and early 2000s there was a a real dearth of it there just wasn't a whole lot of chinese or translated chinese fiction out there and yeah. what little of it there was um wasn't really they weren't commercial successes. I was sure. about to say, yeah, they're academic. Absolutely. Kind of dry looking covers with serif fonts and borders. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's where Howard Goldblatt, I think, really made a name for himself because he didn't go the academic route. I, I think as far as I know, he really started translating um, for commercial presses once he retired from academia. But I, you know, don't take my word on that exactly. <laughs> I, mm. I know he put out some translations before that, but I think he really got started after he retired. And he just was prolific. He's been very prolific in the last um, 15 years about. So, yeah, I, I think that's probably the, the main way that his name has become so tied up with Moyens. But also uh, something else I found out while I was doing my research was that Howard Goldblatt was the main one to be on these um prize committees and mm. he would be nominating moyen <laughs> because partly i'm sure because he was translating his work and um and wanted it to be known by other people and so we know about the nobel prize but before the nobel prize uh, long before the nobel prize uh howard goldblatt nominated moyen for the nudstat prize and the nudstat is actually known as the American Nobel. <laughs> At that right. time, he had only just translated um, Red Sorghum and I think one other, if I remember right, or possibly Garlic not. Ballads, maybe? Oh, the Garlic Ballads, possibly. Yeah, maybe those two. And so the, the he, Moyen ended up not being chosen for that prize, maybe because he didn't really have enough work out in translation yet. Right. Uh, but then... Just a few years after that, the same, not really the same committee, but sort of in, so there's these associations in the, in the U.S., in Oklahoma, you know, there's World Literature Today, if you've heard oh, yes. that magazine, mm -hmm. they are uh, a subsidiary or, or they come from Oklahoma University. Is, wait, is it Oklahoma University or University of Oklahoma? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, this is an important distinction for Oklahomans. Do you want me to, <laughs> no, you want me to look it up? it up? Okay. While I you're looking know it up. I should this because my mom lives there. Oh, right. Good grief. Well, don't disappoint her. The University of Oklahoma World Literature. Yeah. While, while you're looking it up, um, so in the last episode, there was a moment where I was talking to Ken Leo and he went, oh, I was sorry, I went, oh, a sparrowhawk just flew past my window. And he said, it's a, a good omen for you. This time, a fighter jet has just been doing some circuits in the sky. Uh, there is a reason for that. I'm at my girlfriend's place on mm. one side of the River Eden. The other side of the River Eden is the Lukers military slash air base. So it's wow. not so weird that there's planes flying about, but I've never seen a fighter flying here. So yeah. That's if very I, exciting. I don't know if my microphone was picking it up, but yeah. I didn't hear anything. Okay. 
the listeners probably didn't either. Um, did you find While anything about While we're talking Oklahoma? about this, though, yes, I yes. said the wrong name before. James Brown, not Bobby Brown. Bobby Brown was Whitney Houston's husband. Not right. the right name. James <laughs> Brown is who James I'm talking Brown. about, you know. <laughs> okay, the listeners uh, <sighs> will stop. All the more, more uh, Motown fans will stop pulling their hair out now. <laughs> yeah, I did find it. It's University of Oklahoma. Okay, cool. So, um, the University of Oklahoma is associated, or the World World Literature Today, that magazine is associated with University of Oklahoma, and then from World Literature Today came the magazine Chinese Literature Today, CLT, yes. and that's also from the University of Oklahoma. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's and, been one of the texts on the show, uh, the episode... I mentioned it before, uh, the Han Song, The Fundamental Nature of the Universe episode, uh, yes. that was, story was in that uh, journal. And the only way yes. to read the story is if you've got academic access or if right. you splash out and buy an, an issue. It is a gorgeous journal. I will say that. They they have very high publication standards and it's a joy to read. It's a lovely magazine. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I do know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so... The Nudestat Prize is associated with world literature today. Howard Goldblatt was on that committee. And then later, uh, a prize was created called the Newman Prize. And that is for Chinese uh, any work written in Chinese. Uh, and that is associated with Chinese literature today. So there's this, in my mind, and this might be kind of a poor characterization of it, but in my mind, it's a little bit of a club. And mm. Howard Goldblatt was definitely a... a leading member of that club being the lead translator of Moyen I'm I really think that that's one of the big ways that Moyen's name became uh, reputable as a Chinese author in translation and also how Howard Goldblatt's name became so connected with Moyen mm. speaking about it being a club there's a, a an article or a piece in there that I think really gives a show of just how I don't know clubby or or just in it um how Goldblatt is it's I think it's called I the name is Spanish I think it means like at my house or something but it's um Howard Goldblatt being interviewed by How Go Wen which is just him <laughs> he, a yeah. self interview that he wrote himself got published in that and it sounds ridiculously self indulgent and it kind of is but it's also a really good read yeah <laughs> I think I think one needs academic access to read it but um, if any mm. listeners contact me, I can um, use my dark magic to probably get you access somehow. But um, <laughs> yeah. yes. it's a good one. Yeah. So um, we've talked a little bit about how Moyan and Howard Goldblatt are linked together. I want to talk a little bit about Howard Goldblatt's style of translation, which I think, I think as he states in that um, interview with himself or interview with his Chinese alter ego or whatever it's supposed to be, he stresses he's never written about his like a theory of translation but he has talked about like his philosophy or his a, a, approach or, or mm -hmm. practice or whatever so although this is probably not something that can easily be described maybe partly because it's changed over time and it like there isn't a strict theory what what do you think his style of translation is and then assuming that you think there is a style what do you think of that style um what comes to mind for me is his <laughs> admonition i'm not sure if that's the right word but he said somewhere once that most people are scared of the original text as in most translators end up being a bit scared of the original text right and i that has stuck with me to be quite honest <laughs> i've heard that he's fairly liberal in his practice as in uh, maybe reading a paragraph and then essentially paraphrasing rather than doing a word by word or literal translation. Right. And then if you go and compare any two paragraphs, and I've done this, <clears throat> they're very, very similar, like almost eerily similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so that doesn't stop people, of course, from studying the differences that do happen, <laughs> which is fine. But I personally don't like when people get hung up on those differences, mm -hmm. especially in this day and age. And the reason why I say that is because this is a bit different mm -hmm. from the colonial period, for example. Mm -hmm. There's always a power balance um, that happens when when there's translation happening. Right. But I, you know, and like with the stuff that I've been doing for my PhD, that you often have these 
Japanese imperialists, or yeah, you could say that pretty much, <laughs> translating Chinese writers, and then there would be differences. And you just can't help but think, well, it was probably due to want the censorship and propaganda.、Mm -hmm. It's it's almost inevitable. But I don't think we really have quite the same issues now.、Um, so I think that it's you know there's something to be said about、uh, translating in good faith. Right. And I think that Howard Goldblatt does do that.、Um, I one second. I think that when you read Moyen in the original as a native English speaker, there's a sense that. Wow, this could be really special in English, and I think that Howard Goldblatt sees that better than most translators.、Mm -hmm. um, he has said in an interview at some point that it, to be a good translator, you need to read a lot in your native language as well to find out the syntax and and just how、mm. beautiful language works. For sure,、um, yeah, yeah. So for me, as an aspiring writer slash translator slash scholar, I took a lot of inspiration from when he said to not be scared of the text. And it it made me read Chinese、um, and also Korean. I do a little bit of Korean.、It、made me read languages other than English in a different way, and、mm -hmm. that's because above all, I try to come to the text out of interest, excitement, love, anticipation, but not out of fear, which can be hard. So、right. I, I quite appreciate his style. I like how he talks about it, and I don't. Yeah, I'm glad that he. Uh, doesn't really say he conforms to any sort of、uh, theory. I think that's probably that would probably not be conducive for creative work. No, exactly. Yeah. So、um, there was、um, a piece of academic like study of his translation, kind of like paragraph by paragraph or line by line, and I I did、mm -hmm. find it interesting because something that kind of came up in my、uh, dissertation research and this podcast is kind of the difference of the role of the editor. In China、oh, versus、yeah. what、well, I don't know, I don't know about English literature or non-Chinese literature or what, but like the difference in the role of the editor there versus what me and you would maybe think of a normal editor's role,、mm -hmm. where basically it seems like in the PRC editors don't do as much. They've got way less say, less input. So,、um, or they might even their main role might even be. To help stuff be friendly for the censors, so to speak. So, like from a literary angle, there's not too much chopping down going on. So, this、uh, study of Howard Goldblatt's translation mentioned this, like how Howard Goldblatt seems to be aware, or they were speculating he's maybe aware that the text hasn't had the level of editorial attention, something being published straight from English would. So, they looked at instances where he simplified stuff or got rid of repetitions. Or and, and I can't think of any specific examples,、um, but they they did find instances where he was taking like a kind of a an editorial role with a little bit of the editor's chisel. And you could, I mean, you could come at that and say this is very problematic. But the examples they gave, the the writer, the academics themselves working on the essay were,、um, I don't think they were too judgmental. They were just saying this is just something he does. Call it、mm -hmm. call it good, call it bad. He is. Taking a little bit of an editorial role, other translators wouldn't. And yeah, the examples I saw, it looked pretty justified. But、That's、it is about what I've seen as well. Yeah, well, it is an interesting thing where if you're an English reader,、uh, an English language reader, you wouldn't know he was doing it unless、um, oh, someone told you. So、yeah. I don't think that's sinister per se, but it's an interesting、mm. kind of invisible process that not every、you、translator would... would undertake. Exactly, and you wouldn't necessarily know it if he did it. You would definitely notice if he didn't do it, <laughs> right?、And、well said. <laughs>、um, I think that's the key for English readers because Goldblatt has talked about how,、um, in the past at least, Chinese readers were perfectly fine with reading very long novels,、uh, novels that hadn't really, like you said, been touched by the editor's pen.、Um, so lots of repetition, lots of stuff that just kind of goes on a tangent, things that maybe aren't.、Uh, Especially well written compared to the rest of the text, or or whatever it is, and he has talked about how in English it maybe it's partly、um, the time period. You know, those types of novels used to be perfectly fine,、mm. and now they're just out of date. They're a little bit not. They're just not very trendy these days. So in some ways, to keep it marketable, to keep it、um, palatable for English readers, that's one of the things you kind of have to do. Right. Um, something that's come up on the show a lot,、um, but which I've not dealt with in an episode yet, but really should, is、um, web fiction in China.、Mm. Although, like light online novels, although they exist、mm. in English, I think they exist in Japanese too. But like certainly, I know in China, these things、uh, 
can just go on forever. They can have thousands yes. of chapters. Um, so the idea that the kind of market-friendly Western paperback isn't the only form fiction has to take is, is an interesting one. But um, it is absolutely yeah, something I I I don't know how I'll get into it, but it's something I should get into in a future episode. Uh, but anyway, let let's charge on and talk about the translation of Radish itself. Because like okay. you said, you've you've read about half the original and you've read the full English one. Um, but before we talk about uh, like the, the main body, what do you think about the uh, Howard's uh, rendering of the English title? Because it's not the same as the Chinese. Um, what do you think Absolutely. about that? I quite, I'm quite okay with how he rendered it in terms of its conciseness. I've tried to think of maybe how, not really how I would translate it, but just more of a literal translation. And I think... In some ways, I thought to myself that it would give away too much of the text, and then I realized, well, actually, I think it kind of points to something that isn't even um, useful in the text. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm not really sure. So I, I kind of, I can get behind his decision to just shorten it to radish instead of the transparent red radish or, mm. <laughs> or red transparent radish or red clear radish or you know any of those re- mm-hmm. renderings so a hong a hong lo bo isn't a specific vegetable it's just red no. radish right yeah okay. and and you know i was getting confused for a long time too <laughs> because i was i was getting it confused with hulo bo which is carrot but that right. is a completely different thing and i think i was just not paying close enough attention <laughs> so yeah no yeah. different <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a run-in with vegetable names one time. Um, I posted a jar of... I, I, don't, I think it was just a nice-looking photo, but it seems really stupid when I say it, but I, I posted a jar of beetroots that my mom had put... Mm. Well, some beetroots my mom had put in a jar and then captioned it with something like, don't touch mama's beets. And then I tried <laughs> doing it in Chinese as well. And whatever <laughs> word I used for beetroot was one my dictionary gave me. But my Chinese friends were saying, oh, is it the... I don't know, the sweet red vegetables? So like the... Tian Hong Lobo or something. And yeah, I was like, oh my goodness, I really, my Chinese vegetable vocabulary is not up to scratch. Yeah, yeah, they can be tricky. <laughs> yeah. Um, One character makes mm-hmm. it all different. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this question is a bit general. Maybe we could apply it to. Uh, radish but yeah i i read in one piece of uh, academic writing possibly the same one that was talking about his editorial uh, tendencies that howard goldblatt's become keener to preserve rather than de-exotic uh, I, no this was in his self on self interview but I th- he said he's become keener to preserve rather than de-exoticize um chinese elements in the story so basically an example of that might be this is not something he's done but let's say there's a phoenix in the story de-exoticizing it would be calling it a phoenix preserving it would be calling it a feng huang and he mm-hmm. he said he initially preferred to um uh de-exoticize because he didn't want to be accused of orientalism like making the books fancy and mysterious and he said his, his wife sylvia lin was more on like preserving side and he his feeling whether he's not he's right or wrong his feeling was that because she's already um chinese it's not this or charge of orientalism is not an issue for her but he said he's basically become more keen to preserve elements more more like his wife in that sense and i wondered if that's maybe because as his career has gone quite well for him is he feeling more secure more confident more like unassailable so to speak um mm-hmm. i don't uh, these are all just speculations i don't know and I haven't. I've only read this one story, so I haven't even seen this progression in his own translation. So I guess what I'd ask you is, um, bearing in mind this translation is from 2015, do you think it matches that pattern that um, he became more keen on preserving stuff, or do you think it doesn't really apply here? Oh, I think it. Um, well, I don't. He didn't really use any specific words here. In no, Radish. I don't think but so. But in no. other works, he absolutely does. Sandalwood Death is a perfect example of that because there's a lot of, um, a lot of terms in there that he keeps, and he just renders in pinyin and then italicizes it, and he gives he provides a glossary. I think at the beginning that um, readers can consult. I found it. Right. In fact, I, I want to say that it was at the beginning of that novel that he also has an introduction where he talks about his decision to do that. Mm. So, yeah, I I 
I think that it's a really good thing to do as a Chinese learner and also as someone who would like to see more younger people taking Chinese mm. quite seriously. I think this is a really important thing. Also, you know, when you, I think it was in that introduction to Sandalwood Death, actually, he talks about how that's a really common thing that we have from Japanese, for example. You know, everybody knows what a kimono is. Or karaoke. <laughs> or karaoke, or so many other words. And that's because they have been de exoticized, they've been sort of naturalized into English. And mm. um, he argues that it's time for Chinese words to be the same. Um, mm. It, it's interesting because you, when you're translating, you're not always sure which words you should do that for. Like sometimes it's obvious, but other times it's not so obvious. You know, you might preserve it at first and then come back to it and realize, oh, that's not necessary. Or the opposite could be true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there might be a specific reason. It depends on the purpose you're writing. Um, I was wondering if your question was related specifically to the title or not. It could be. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, I hadn't. I I was wondering because I I don't consider um any of the words in the title Toming or Holobo or any just any combination. I don't really consider that so specific. I think no. that they're just kind of signs and symbols rather than a cultural or a distinct cultural facet or yeah. feature. So yeah, I think that he tends to do this more for very distinct things where it's mm-hmm. hard to have a translation. There's just not the equivalent. Um, I'm trying to think of the main one that he does it for in Sandalwood Death, but I can't remember the exact word. <laughs> mm-hmm. I want to say that it's Yemen, and I feel like I'm getting that wrong because I haven't looked at that book for a very long time. But right. um, it's, the, it's a specific... A uh, political role, essentially, a scholar official would have this role, and he'd be sent out to the county as the head. And that is, uh, there are some words that Goldblatt could have chosen. He discusses those in the introduction, and mm. you know things like gentry or knight or or whatever. But none of those were, really would have captured what that job entails, mm, and no. they were all just a little bit too low level compared to what. The job of um, the what what the job that he's actually talking about is. So mm-hmm. he explained that, and it becomes very clear from the get go with that story um, because the person who has that role has such a big like he's such an important character in the book. So yeah, I think that um, maybe I'm not making this case very well though, since I don't remember the word precisely. <laughs> but we get it point. is also. It's a role that doesn't exist anymore either. Like this is something that existed in the Qing Dynasty, mm-hmm. <laughs> in ancient Chinese culture, not so much, um, or not maybe not ancient, but pre-modern culture. Mm-hmm. It certainly hasn't existed for the last hundred years. So, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe if any listeners are big fans of Sandalwood Death and have read it in English, or I guess in oh, Chinese, it's such a could... good novel. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. If if anyone knows the answer and is screaming it, zap it somewhere <laughs> in my direction, but on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, um, and then you can uh, shed some light on that for me. What you were saying about some words kind of entering English from from Japanese, and it kind of it would be nice for that to happen from Chinese. Um, there's a book I've covered on the show um, which does that. Um, I think maybe partly thanks to it, its translator Ken Liu. It's Waste Tide. Uh, Waste Tide. It's set in um, Guangdong. Um, it's by Chen Fan, who's who's from there. And it the, the original Chinese has Mandarin alongside like the local um, Chaoshanhua like dialect, but it also has like characters um, from. There's a character from Hong Kong. I think Japanese elements are somewhat involved. Uh, there's an American Chinese character, and that's kind of right up Ken Leo's wheelhouse because he's quite he's quite what's the right word he tries to stress that within china and its region there's an awful lot of diversity that tends to get flattened so in the english version there's a lot of uh, words from east asian languages that are italicized and preserved and some of them are ones we would know like japanese words like i, I don't know if karaoke is in there but a word or or maybe banzai tree or something those ones Mm-hmm. And there's stuff from Mandarin, like feng shui, that we might know, stuff from Cantonese that we might know, like dim sum. But then he peppers in some other new quote unquote words, which sit alongside all these other ones. And it's just an interesting kind of stew because they're not 
it's not like he's doing this mission just for Mandarin. It's for all the languages. Yeah, and it's just a small cool. it's a small element in the book, but it um it's true. Once you've seen it on the page a few times, the Taoist, it is just part of the book's vocabulary, even if it's not necessarily entered English. Absolutely. So it's um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. One yeah, of the words um, that uh, he uses in Sandalwood Death, and actually I think he, no, he doesn't use it in Radish. Oh, tell me if he uses it in Radish, because now I'm getting confused between the Chinese and English versions. <laughs> but uh, the word for father in the north is not baba or ba, as you would learn it in um, your Chinese class. It's actually mm, dia, and yeah. that's the word that he uses throughout Sandalwood Death. Um, right. And I think, and it is the word that Moyen himself uses throughout all his novels because it takes place in Gaomi and Shandong. So, mm. um, but yeah, it, he, it's definitely in the Chinese in Radish, but I, I'm not sure if it's in English. I, 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 if I had the ebook, I could do a control and F and try and find it. Um, I think it's just Father. I wonder if that's maybe because this is like a small, self-contained book, so he didn't, you yeah. know, he didn't have room for like a a vocabulary list. Um, possibly, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's just father, but um, not sure. I think the only the only thing that had me wondering about that was the boy's name, Hey Hi, which as mm. the, reading the English book, I'm only seeing rendered in the alphabet, um, or Pinyin, and I know Hey can mean like dark or black, and Hi can mean boy, and it says right on the front this dark skinned boy. So is does Hey Hi's name is it like black boy in in the Chinese? Uh, well, he is called Hey Hi, but and that does mean black or dark boy or dark mm. child, but um, it's whether it's his actual name or just kind of a nickname is unclear. Mm. I took it to be more of a nickname than an actual yeah. name. Yeah. Ba- mainly that's just because pretty much all of Moyen's characters are like that. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. That's kind of what I thought. I was, I was just curious how it looked in the, the original Chinese. So we've talked the quite a lot. The in, about... in Radish is Liu Taiyang, and there's a moment when it talks about, like, there's the description of the sun, and Taiyang actually mm-hmm. means sun, and it's the characters for that. <laughs> so that's kind of uh, funny, too. Um, right. Yeah. Names mm. are a tricky one, because sometimes it's helpful, and Goldblatt has talked about this, sometimes it's helpful to uh, render it as a meaning-type name, like, mm-hmm. well, I guess Hey Hi is not a good example, um, but others are. And then other yeah. times it's not very useful to do that, like with Liu Taiyang. Yeah. You wouldn't want to see it as Mr. Sun Liu or something. That would just be confusing. Is that like S U N, Sun? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like doubly confusing because that could exactly. be Sun as well. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I remember I was kind of introduced to the. Um, well, my mind kind of got blown by these particular in- intricacies my first year in China, where I was like very much jumping in the deep end. And I had tried to get to some water town. I'd bungled it. I got off at a bus stop. I got into like an unofficial taxi, which you're never supposed to do. And that whether or not the driver was fleecing me, I don't know. But he was very friendly. And he had, for like a rural taxi driver, he had pretty impressive command of English. He's asking me about like my name and he told me his name and he was telling me about all his friends and family's name and he's telling me his generation had a particular kind of name. I really don't it's he he wasn't using a phone to tell me this, I don't think. I don't know. I don't know how we were communicating. Like he wasn't using a translator (laughs) app. He was telling me this in like simple English. I don't know how we did it. But anyway, he he was like, Oh yeah, I have a brother or a friend called Build the Nation. (laughs) Yeah. Jian Guo, that's a very common name. Jian Guo, right. Um, and maybe another friend called Red Flag or oh, Red. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. oh, yep. Mm-hmm. From a uh-huh. certain generation, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yes to all of those communist symbols. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting there in the car being like, damn, there's lots of things I don't know about this country and this language. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, um, and the same here. I'm always feeling like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about translation quite a wee while. I thought it'd be good to get onto the story. Now, this is like where I'm going to get as self-indulgent as Howard Goldblatt interviewing himself, um, because like, I had a very particular take on this book that was influenced by things I was reading and listening to in the podcast sphere at the time. But I think mm-hmm. it's a fairly valid reading. So I've got a long preamble that I've literally printed out to read because there's no way I could remember this and I want to say it fairly precisely. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't know what to expect before opening this book. Um, I was expecting maybe something similar to other writers from Moyan's generation 
or perhaps something special and different because he had that Nobel Prize to his name. And I found it was definitely more the latter. It was something more unique, not just like magical realism from China or whatever. Um, there was segments of like description in the book that I didn't feel like I had anything I'd read before. And they weren't gritty realism. They weren't tense and fast paced like you were saying his other books might be. They weren't like Carnivale magical realism. I remember reading um, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez and getting a bit fed up the hundredth time that a parade of gypsies and musicians marched into the town or whatever <laughs> felt a bit fr i mean that's maybe a bad thing to say but i was like the magical maybe it's just because it was very early magical realism but it felt a bit frivolous to me and um, mm -hmm. i wasn't getting any frivolity in this story really um yeah and it wasn't the sur it wasn't creepy creeping weird surrealism either to me it was more weird with with a capital w capturing like strange and unspoken things that can happen in ghost stories or things in this little subgenre that exists called weird weird fiction or weird stories which as far as i'm aware has been a thing for a long time but is having a little bit of a resurgence just now so like some writers who usually get thrown in this category are ghost or writers like Arthur Macken, R. James, um, Lovecraft himself for a very more, maybe more like horror fantasy version of the same thing. Uh, there's a book I read called The King in Yellow, which was one of the things that inspired True Detective, a TV show which was realist, but had a very strong kind of weird gothic undercurrent. And then modern times, the big guy from an editorial and writing perspective, uh, pushing weird fiction is, is Jeff Vandermeer, the guy who did the Southern Reach trilogy that got adapted as a, a film called Annihilation. Um, and the thing that was weird about Radish for me was through the words on the page I was reading, I was kind of getting glimpses of the world I perceived as a child. And I don't know if this is the same for you, for everyone, but like my memory of my very early picture of the world was like a bit weird distance was not always consistent um things like shapes and fabrics and surfaces caught my attention in weird ways i don't remember them being always that concrete sometimes i have memories of like very intense uh, sensory input sometimes it's very faint i know i'm describing this in a strange way but i think it's precisely because like childhood started through memories and being literally as a child you're literally not familiar with the whole world things are like kind of unprocessed unframed um unfiltered uh, it's a weird oh, yeah. it's, it's a weird place and it, it's a weird time to remember so one thing i did as prep for the episode along with reading about Harry Goldblatt and Moyan and so on was looking to see if there was any like science that would describe why i remember childhood this way how childs view the world and Googling that, you have to get through a lot of kind of lists and clickbait and pseudosciencey things. But I did find some uh, like research articles, which basically the finding of some research about the way kids' senses work is that until they're, well, until they're 12, but especially before eight, human being senses don't integrate. So your sight, hearing, touch, and your taste slash smell, they're all kind of like different feeds. And you don't have quite a, as clear a picture of the world, but every sense maybe is more distinct in a way and then by the time even before you're an adult by the time you're a teenager these senses have integrated into one kind of thing that you process at the same instance another similar thing i found was that a study indicated that like the binocular vision we have of two eyes producing one image doesn't work as well when you're a kid so um kids weren't able to judge depth and distance as well as adults um and this might seem all really removed from radish but i've bookmarked two little sections that I'm going to try and read, well, I'm going to read that I think get across what I'm talking about. And then once I've read those two, I will shut up and ask you <laughs> if any of this <laughs> resonates for you. Uh, so where are we? Let me just find this. Right. So in this scene, Hei Hai is doing some work, hammering some rocks as part of, I think, the Great Leap Forward. This All this work is going on in the countryside. He's been roped into it, even though he's a small boy, but he gets a bit distracted. He grasped a rock with his left hand and raised the hammer with his right. The effort seemed to exhaust him, and the hammer dropped like a heavy object in free fall. She nearly cried out every time she saw the hammer descending towards his hand, but nothing happened. The hammer traced a wobbly arc in the air, but always landed on the rock. Hei Hai's eyes were fixed on the rocks at first, but a strange sound drifted over from the river, thin and faint like nibbling fishes, now near, now far. 
Straining to capture it with both eyes and ears, he saw a bright gassy cloud rising from the river, which seemed to capture the oscillating hum within. His cheeks grew ruddy and an affecting smile gathered at the corners of his mouth. And then he forgets what he's doing and he hammers his own thumb. But um, mm. that's one example of kind of like what might be a superpower he has, his senses, or might be some kind of poetic picture of the way this child sees the world that adults around him don't. So that's right. one. And here's the other where he's, again, he's fixated on the river and he's gone down to the river, so to speak. On the levee, branches of the river locust stretched and intertwined. He reached up to a part, he reached up to part them with one hand, then hunched his shoulders and walked up the slope. His hand brushed against the full ripe seed pods on the damp tips of the branches. The pungent scent of the branches assailed him. His foot bumped into something soft and warm and he heard a chirp. Before he realized that it was a bamboo partridge, the bird had flapped its way out of the brush and landed in a jute field like a dark stone. Feeling somewhat guilty, he touched the spot where the bird had been resting with his foot. It was dry, a clump of grass that still retained the bird's warmth. From where he stood on the levee, he heard the woman and the mason shout his name. He banged on the side of his bucket, and the shout stopped. He heard the river rushing forward brightly, and the screech of an owl on a tree somewhere in the village. His stepmother was afraid of two things, thunder and the screech of an owl. He wished there were thunder every day, and a screeching owl at his stepmother's window every night. The dew on the river locust sweated his arms, which he wiped dry on his shorts as he crossed the levee road and started down the other side. By then he'd gotten used to the dark and could see clearly, could even distinguish the subtle difference between the brown of the soil at his feet and the purple of the sweet potato leaves. He crouched down, picked up one of the sweet potatoes and tossed it into his bucket where it rattled around. He dug some more until he felt something drop off his finger and heard it bounce off a sweet potato leaf. Feeling his left hand with the right, he discovered that the damaged fingernail had fallen off. By now, his bucket was heavy, so he stood up and headed north. When he reached the radish field, he picked six in a row, twisted off the leafy tops, threw them to the ground, and tossed the radishes into his bucket. So there you go, ending on radishes. That was lovely, yeah. It's nice, isn't it? It is, and it's actually a really, I think it would be a wonderful story to have a, a reading for. Mm. Um, to be heard that read out loud, I think just, <clears throat> it it's a sensory type of novel, and mm -hmm. I think it deserves that type of um, vocal vocalization of it uh, like i said before following it this time for me was sometimes difficult but hearing you read it i was i was in it <laughs> i was good <laughs> Great. I, I could yeah absolutely i could imagine every little detail and it was much easier actually to hear it than it is to than it was to read it i remember that particular mm -hmm. section i even had to reread that section so it's right. quite interesting and yeah, I, it, it makes be a sense tragedy to me. if you skipped over that for sure <laughs> yes it makes sense to me because moyen has talked many times about um just how he he means his writing to be read out loud uh Something I didn't know until quite recently, actually, was that in the old times, uh, reading was not really something you did silently in Chinese. And, and mm -hmm. I do mean in the Chinese language. Like, I'm talking about in the pre-modern times when it wasn't everybody who was literate even. So among the literati, basically the scholar officials, they didn't just, they might have read for pleasure, but they didn't just read silently. Most of the time they'd be reading out loud. Uh, they'd be, it would be almost like a chant for themselves mm. uh, and, and whoever might be around because sometimes they would read together with their friends, for example. So I think that Moyen that's one of those traditions that he is he values and it comes through in his works. Mm. I think I remember reading this and maybe some other nice pieces of short fiction and thinking, oh, next time I'm at an open mic, because there's an open mic my friends do that I sometimes go to, maybe I'll just introduce and say, I'm not going to read my own stuff. I'm going to read this author's story. And then I common sense kicked in and I thought, no, wait. That that's not good. Everyone will oh, be annoyed. Oh, let common sense go away. I would like, <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. I think you should totally do that. <laughs> yeah, um, and also it it means you have to lose the ego of wanting to read your own stuff. But um, yeah, I might think about doing that. Mm. Reading us, yeah. So yeah, did, how about like the angle of like the the weirdness? Do you think it's a oh, weird yeah. with the big W story? So I I have 
heard you mention that before in other episodes. Mm. Uh, and I wasn't really sure about it for a while. And I definitely wasn't sure if Moyen fit that bill. Mm-hmm. But the but then I started looking into it because my biggest question was, is this something that scholars have also latched on to? Or is it more um, the lay readers who are talking about the weird, even capital W? Yeah. I just wasn't sure. So because I wasn't familiar with it at all. So I went looking around and um, yeah, I can see that it comes from both sides. <laughs> and that's part of what has changed my mind about magical realism. I think that especially with radish i can really see why you would consider it weird um or part of the weird let's say style or mm. even genre i don't um, know what you'd call it yeah yeah More it's weirdness. not yeah it's not so much that it has to do with um horror or you know the supernatural or ghosts or anything like that but i do think uh it just coming from that child's point of view and having it be a little bit disconnected from the wider world, I think it just puts it into a different space, mm-hmm. if not yeah. time even. Yeah. Yeah. An, an idea that really strikes me is like almost like a idea from genre fiction rather than rational thinking, but it's an idea that comes from Western rational philosophy. The idea that our senses give us access to something, but the thing that we're mm-hmm. seeing is not a full picture of reality. We only see God knows what small slice of the electromagnetic spectrum but the idea right. that occasionally other things might slip through that's right. like that's literally well the thing the thing about things slipping through isn't scientific but the idea that we're only seeing a portion of what's real that's true um mm-hmm. but i think using that as a literary device is as a recipe for infinite fun and yeah i don't think i don't think that's necessarily what moyan's doing but that's what i get from this story for sure well like, i i don't know actually i think that mm-hmm. um if you were if you or someone else were to bring this concept up to him, I'll bet he would quite enjoy it. And like, just, just knowing how he writes and it seems to be kind of how he looks at the world. I think he would find it very entertaining to say the least, but Mm. especially in terms of the childlike perspective, I think that he has tried very hard to, to preserve that in all of his works. Mm. Um, it to me this to me radish says a lot about innocence than more than anything really not yeah. just the innocence of a child but the innocence of the of human nature mm-hmm. so yeah i'm kind of where my mind was going with the weird was i wanted to know what the larger significance of it is so does it tell us something about ourselves does it tell us something about our societies or our memories or things like that. And that's something that I was actually wondering if I could ask you was just um, because, Mm -hmm. because you were able to draw on your own memory memories of childhood. One of my questions was, well, what is childhood Um, Mm -hmm. and what is the significance of it to you, especially in relation to this story or in the wider sense? Right. Um, Well, so much of it is like stuff I can't really articulate. It's just like memories of particular things I've sensed, like being two and sitting in a room watching TV. And the, I remember the room being dimly lit. Things like that would be boring to try and describe objectively because I can't. I would just be ex- describing half remembered minutia forever and ever. But I can give you like a more concrete example. Um, have you ever seen the? It's kind of like a a meme or like a graphic that's been created of it's a picture of the man who would run alongside your car when as a kid you would look out the window and some kids would imagine a man running alongside it Mm. did you ever do that as a child i can picture it in my mind i'm Mm -hmm. not sure if i did that but yeah 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 whenever i was sat in the back of a car on on a motorway when we were going fast i would imagine some kind of person running alongside and jumping over obstacles or oh, interesting, a, yeah. A, yeah or as like a kid in p1 i could really clearly picture like little sonic the hedgehog running along the tops of the boards that were on the wall and using <laughs> the whole thing as an obstacle course and there's a thing i would do which i'm not saying i i'm not saying this is me but do you know about synesthesia no okay so synesthesia is um thing where particular people have like some crossover between their different senses um so to give you one example 
I have a friend who had it as a kid. It's faded as he's grown up. But whenever he gets high on the old herbal cigarettes he, and he listens to music, he can see the music. Um, Interesting. Which you'd never, I can't, you know, until you've done that, how the, how the hell would you try and imagine visualizing it? <laughs> right. Yeah. And as a, as a kid, like, I think he had one of the more classic um, synesthes, like the most... I don't know, like the equivalent of being allergic to dog hair or cat hair and synesthesia is having colors assigned for certain numbers and letters. So, for mm. example, one, synes- one person with synesthesia, the letter R will always be blue. For another person with mm. synesthesia, it will always be black. But the associations are fixed. And as a kid, I remember having like halfway towards that. My brain really wanted to particular numbers and letters to be particular colors, but it mm. never quite set. And I have memories of that feeling, hmm. but that feeling is gone. I I can only right. pretend I have that now. And I did meet a kid at Shanghai High School, a kid who I was helping write an essay uh, for a university application, and she mentioned that she had synesthesia. And I said, do you really? Or have you made that up to be interesting? And she's like, no, I really do. <laughs> write your name and I'll tell you what color it is. And she did. And she's <laughs> like, uh, orange, blue, white. But yeah, wow. it's... Um, that's so fascinating. The, yeah. So that would probably be a case of kids seeing things that aren't actually there. Yeah. Um, but I'm really. This makes me think of Moyen's use of color because he's always using colors, and he does tend to use the colors red and green a lot. Right. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it, they come out in unexpected places and a, and some expected places, but they are there constantly. Mm-hmm. Well, I think yeah. when we're when we're old, just whether you want to use fancy academic words like filtered or uh, integrated, but we take everything for granted, and as a kid. You're, nothing is for granted or you know there's no reason why things happen um why is the sky blue because right. it is blue why not fixate on the color of the sky why not fixate on the clouds because you don't know why they're there and they right. might be gone one minute here one minute gone the next exactly but yeah and i'm getting, so getting as into were... mysticism now <laughs> <laughs> well but as you were talking i'm i was thinking about what it would look like to have those descriptions in fiction Mm. And I feel in some ways like they would look very modernist, Mm -hmm. um, very stream of conscious, but slightly different because they'd be a bit disconnected um, in a more childlike manner, (laughs) very uh, image heavy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it it, like, for example, you were talking about um, being in the car, seeing someone just imagining someone running alongside. I used to every time it rained, I used to imagine the windshield wipers. As, um, you know, when they would go across to the left, that would mean that the right one would steal tomatoes out of the garden. And then if go to the right, it would be the left one chasing the one out of the garden. <laughs> I, I remember like, being really what? fixated on windscreen wipers as a kid. Not yeah. not with your specific uh, tomato-based <laughs> idea, but um, I was very fixated on the little triangle in the bottom that they wouldn't touch. And I was waiting right. for them to wipe that away. And of course, it actually could... really annoyed me that mm. the one on the left never could quite catch the one on the right because <laughs> the one on the right would always just be right, you know, just too far yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that also kept me fixated. Um, this, if I were to describe that in a fictional piece, like you said, it might just come across as minutia. It might perhaps be meaningless without some wider context going on i'm mm-hmm. gonna pause real fast now i can go back to it so i i think what makes moyen's work so interesting and probably significant is that he has that minutia and he has that childlike sense of wonder and sometimes confusion about the world mm-hmm. and it's taking place in these really um radical conditions often right you know? um Radish is actually a really cool story in that there's nothing too political about it. Like life and death are wearing me out. That's a a very politically heavy story as well. It's it's an epic novel and it's a historic epic novel because it takes place during the Cultural Revolution and actually before. It takes place through the whole hundred years of the 20th century, really. Um, A crazy time in China. Exactly. And it, it it's wonderful for so many reasons, but it doesn't like it it cannot really be read outside of history. Right. Radish, I think, has a little bit of an advantage in that it's not really... uh, Well, I mean, you know the context, you know where it's happening, but in some ways, especially reading the translation, it really could happen 
on any farm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of because... industrial stuff going on, but you don't need yes. to know why. It's not essential. Exactly. I guess partly I found that reading the translation, I was finding it kind of hard to imagine what the characters looked like. Which might be a good hmm. thing. In my mind, they just weren't coming out as Chinese. <laughs> and I'm not sure, sure. why. Um, which is not a bad thing. But I think it had to do with language and just the fact that it's not a very long story. You know, as you said, it's a novella. It's mm. not very long. So unlike some of his epic novels, you don't really get the time to go into the character and really imagine each character in their home setting, for example. Mm -hmm. You just kind of get these snapshots uh, or these these frames. And I think within those frames, the characters like the Mason and the Blacksmith and Jidza, they're they're described beautifully. I do love them. They're characterized fully. But for me, for whatever reason, reading the English translation, I just wasn't picturing Chinese people. <laughs> And I don't know why. I was trying to, mm. but I couldn't. And part of it, I think, was mm. because of the uh, very down-to-earth language. You know, when um, you know when the manager, not the manager, when the supervisor, and also the Mister Liu, when they shout at people, and they inevitably swear. I can't help but think of my own family, <laughs> my own <sighs> family background, because they're. Right. I come from farmers. Like I said, I grew up in rural Arizona. You know. <laughs> Mm. It's and I remember my dad saying once that um well we also grew up in a really religious family where swearing is not really a good thing to do you know it's quite taboo but right. I remember my dad saying well I know we're not supposed to swear but it's <laughs> you know it's damn hard to <laughs> raise cattle without swearing <laughs> he's going to hell for <laughs> or, that one or he said something like it's it's hard to um it's flipping hard do with cattle yeah something like that <laughs> yeah that's funny. <laughs> I think yeah. I did. I did visualize everyone as being Chinese, but I reckon. Well, there's one guarantee that I would do that, and that's that I have the physical book, and there's a little picture of Hey Hi on the cover, ah, yes. and he's he's mm -hmm. only got his little shorts on, and he's got a little kind of off the time and place bowl cut sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Yeah, I saw that bowl cut as well. But then in the story, it describes him as having like the hair grows out and it's just sticking straight out. Which right. when I heard when I read that, I was like, yes, now I can imagine this little Chinese boy. <laughs> um, mm. And I just actually, Hey Hai was the easiest person to imagine. Um, mm. It was, yeah, like I said, I think it was really connected to the language. But mm. to me, that's a really important issue when it comes to translation because. Um, you know, there's it brought up a lot of ideas about this connection between China's working classes and global working classes, mm. um, especially the the American Midwest, which is where Howard Goldblatt is from. And right. I'm a big fan of Peter Hessler, for example, and he has written about this as well. Uh, and you know, I'm sure you've probably seen it on Twitter because it's making the rounds. But the Peace Corps, Peace Corps China was dismantled oh, yes, a I few months that. ago and Peter Hessler wrote a piece about it and in it he was talking about how in, one of the best things about it was connecting these working class kids from the US with working class families in China mm. just just for them to get to know each other is such a cool thing to do and it really is I really do think it is and I think that's one of the appeals of Moyen's literature is there are still a lot of people out there who are in the working class who are out in doing industrial jobs or um, farmers, uh, there are, you know, doing very, like, break, what, what's the word? Break back labor? Back breaking. <laughs> back breaking labor. And I think people who have that experience or who, like me, have kind of grown up in that atmosphere with family members who have had that experience, it appeals to us. It, it, if Moyen is writing about his sense of home, that's a surefire way to kind of uh, kindle other people's sense of home. And I, I definitely felt it for me. I mean, I grew up in a place where there are no trees for miles. I mean, it's just oh, flat and brown and there's there are um, dunes, there are mesas, but there aren't really trees, <laughs> so to mm. speak. And there are, mountains are there, but they're very far away. So there's that scene at the beginning where he sees these clouds rolling in and I could just picture that. You know, it was, mm. it was really visceral for me. Uh, and so many of those moments in the story 
came out very, very clearly because of of that background that I have in just growing up in a very rural place. And mm. as a kid growing up in a rural place, you're just looking around waiting for something to happen. <laughs> I can <laughs> imagine that Moyen would in some ways um, be like that as well, just kind of waiting for something to happen, although he had the added benefit of being surrounded by villagers where in China, where something is always happening. <laughs> That is Indeed. absolutely the case there. Right. <laughs> mm. It's funny what you, you said about visualizing the characters as not necessarily looking or, or being Chinese. Um, I've just about never had that with reading any translated stuff from Chinese until just yesterday I read another book in this China specials, like very small Penguin book series, you know, same book design, same series. Mm -hmm which I learned last night was edited by uh, Eric Abrahamson by the magic mm -hmm. of Twitter. He revealed that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a, f a flock of brown birds by Go Fei. And this maybe makes sense. Go Fei is like a avant-garde uh, writer, definitely like a very sort of bourgeois style. Like it's about a guy writing his manuscript out by a lake and he's mm. got a, a friend who shows up who's an artist. I mean, that's a, that's not a very precise description of the book, but like m my family background is um, basically, especially on my dad's side, everyone's a doctor or an artist. So we're certainly mm. not interesting. Certainly not um, backbreaking uh, laborers, at least not in the last generation or two. Um, very much of the Lucian class. <laughs> should I? Should I? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, no point being in denial about that. But um, when I was picturing some of the settings and the characters didn't always look like China they, and they didn't always look like Chinese people, whatever that means. Um, right. But occasionally, like, uh, he goes to a bar and the, the bar, he asks for a bottle of sorghum or whatever and not a beer. Sorghum and I was like, wine. Yeah. yeah, sorghum wine. And I was like, oh, wait, yes, we are in, in Jiangsu somewhere or something. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it, it's an interesting thing to think about. Well, and some... I think that's an, another thing for readers who like Goldblatt who are very familiar with China like they've been in the environment or they were in the environment for a very long time to read something like Moyen it's very um it's it's what's the word I'm thinking of where it's unobstructed basically you it's there's no nothing to tie it down um it's very very down to earth though and sometimes you can as a foreigner when you're in a Chinese speaking environment you can kind of feel disattached <laughs> from yep. what's happening, especially if you don't know the language. But also, you don't always see people's emotions. You can once you start to know what to look for, but you don't always know what you're seeing, especially when you're a mm -hmm. foreigner. You don't really know yeah. how to interpret everything. There are and, in um, invisible things, so to speak, that um, absolutely. you don't see the value of. Yes, and I think that would be the case for any foreigner in any land. But my experiences in China, and I think Goldblatt's is, in, well, it's in China and Taiwan as well. So mm. I think that that's familiar for both of us. And it's, yeah. uh, and, and for you as well, like, because there's that unknown thing, you come to Moyen's works and it's just full of emotion and it's full of uh events that you don't know about like you know they must be happening you read mm. articles sometimes um but then you just don't know the hows of it <laughs> and you don't know the details of it and you really want to know and i'm talking about the gossipy juicy stuff of life you know like right moyen's works are full of sex and that's for a good reason <laughs> <laughs> right like it's it's everywhere and it's stuff that you don't talk about especially when you're a foreigner you don't have access to it at first for a very long time and if you get access you still probably don't really have access right mm -hmm. so getting that in this literary form is very exciting um yeah. just getting all those emotions and uh like, for example, the groups of women in Radish that are just constantly telling each other jokes and teasing each other about the guys that they like and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's normal. But, of course, you don't know if it's going on around you if you don't understand the language. So it's very exciting to then enter the book and be like, okay, this is feeling familiar on both levels. Familiar in that I know women who do that same thing back at home. And I also know who these women are in China. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's it's, very exciting. Yeah. When I was 
actually living in China, the I didn't read an awful lot of translated Chinese stuff. I was more reading Western stuff to get a slice of quote unquote home. Um, right. Yeah. So the stuff I read there was Lu Xun and and Three Body, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And neither of those were really descriptions of where I was living. So yeah, it would have been interesting if I was kind of augmenting my life there with reading I don't know Gofei or Moyan or whatever. But right. too late now. Can't turn the clock back. <laughs> You can try again. <laughs> yeah, from the safety of um, Scotland. <laughs> but yeah, um, we, one of the questions I was going to ask about the story was about the historical setting and whether the story is uniquely Chinese. We've literally just been talking about that. <laughs> yes. So no need me, for me to formally ask that question. Uh, there was like another kind of open-ended question, and I guess this I, I'll modify it slightly. Um, with the exception of everything we've talked about, what else really stands out in Radish for you as a reader? Um, I I think I loved the ending, first of all. like I've talked already about how I kind of struggled to get into it sentence by sentence. I really enjoyed it once I did, but for whatever reason, I was struggling. Should have just read it out loud. Don't know why I didn't. <laughs> um, mm. I did not expect to like the ending. Mm. Um, like I said before, it's, it was so toned down compared to a lot of his other stories. And I really love his stories. So because it was so toned down, I was just like, where is this going to go? Also, I was waiting and waiting and waiting for the radish. <laughs> nah. And, <laughs> and I kind of thought that it had, um, a much more magical type of role. <laughs> mm. And it it doesn't. I think it has a really significant role in a symbolic way, but I it just wasn't what I expected it to be. So I was going along and I was thinking, hmm, I'm not really sure how this is going to end or, or how I'm going to feel about it. But I ended up loving the ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think it's because, and I've been asking myself why, but I think it's because Hey Hi loses some innocence, mm. but at the same time, not fully. In, in very typical Moyen fashion, and I would say even typical of a lot of Chinese fiction. Well, I, maybe I shouldn't say a lot. I'm thinking particularly of Hajin, who actually okay. writes in English. Yep. But very similar twist of irony at the end. So I quite like the ending because on in one sense, he wins what? <laughs> he wins but then it all gets stripped from him quite literally and mm-hmm. he's back to being in the negative negative. and i just kind of feel like of course it would end that way and yet it doesn't destroy him he just <laughs> accepts it and moves on <laughs> and i just i fields. find it yeah i find it i laughed at the end and it wasn't in um you know it wasn't I wasn't laughing at Hey Hi. I was kind of, I felt like I was laughing with him, which is why I liked the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that was one of the things yeah. that stood out for me, definitely. I have a few passages that stood out for me as well. Okay. Do you want to read uh, one or two of them? I'm, yeah, let me find one of them. I, I probably don't need to read too many. Um, uh, I've done two, so, you know. <laughs> To answer your question from earlier, um, I've just flicked to the last page, and it has the word uh, father. What's your father's name? And it is just father. It's not uh, ah, dear. Ah, yes. And that was actually a really poignant moment where he's asking for his father's name. And mm. you know that he can't or he won't speak. He definitely mm. won't speak. And Moyan. Well, yes, exactly. Um, and we also know as readers how pointless that question is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's. I think that's also something that struck me at the end was everything that he had just been through <laughs> was a moot point by the time that was happening. <laughs> yeah, one of the essays I read in prep mentioned that um, he doesn't show any grief or doesn't verbalize any grief about his father being gone is just the thing that's just like the father has mentioned so tears roll out his eye and the the interpretation the essay gave is actually he's been sad about that the whole time but yeah. you as the reader don't get to see it until you get it's given away there at the end that it really has upset him or messed him up yeah exactly i and i would say uh has messed him up definitely upset him i think that is really what lies at the heart of this how aware is he that he's obsessed or that he's um, 
feeling something. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's fully aware. And that's what I think Moyen does best. Um, and I, th- I think this, has a lot to do with Moyen's own life and his own ways of processing what he has seen in his life. Mm. And maybe that's not, that's certainly not the only way to read these stories, but I do think it's so closely related to them because of how he writes. And he, and the fact that he talks about this all the time, like it's one of his ways of processing these things. Um, But I, I really love that moment because it just, you can tell he's not conscious about it. He's not aware. Same with the blacksmith who does this horrible thing and can't process it and so ends up being angry all the time and drinking, you know? Right. Um, and you can just you can just feel the psychological weight of it all as the reader, but you can also really sympathize with these characters that just don't, they're not equipped to deal with the type of... Um, for lack of a better word, trauma that has beset them. Mm-hmm. Um, did you find your passage? I did, yeah. Let's so it, it is a couple of them, and but they're short. R- both of them right at the beginning of chapter four. So the very beginning of chapter okay. four reads, The golden radish splashed into the river, floating on the surface for a moment before settling to the riverbed, where it rolled around until it was buried in golden sand. A heavy mist rose above the spot where it, where it had torn the surface of the river. Mm. In the early morning hours, the mist covered the valley. The river sobbed beneath it. And then it starts to talk about these ducks. And I love this depiction (laughs) of the ducks so much. So, you know, in this first bit that I read, it's uh, the landscape. There's the the color. The golden radish is mirrored by the golden sand. Uh, So we really get Mm -hmm. a sense of this early morning mist and the... the, uh, Kind of the the ethos or the pathos of it. But then... Mm -hmm we get this picture of the ducks and they're swimming around and they're watching the old man carrying the bedding. Um, Then, so I like this part where a drake passed a meaningful look to the female next to it. Remember? It was him that time. The bucket bounced into a willow tree and rolled down to the river. He sprawled like a dog on the ground and then went to the river to get the nearly empty bucket. It could have killed that no good sheldrake. The female replied, right, right. That damn sheldrake is always following me around saying filthy things. Too bad it didn't kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that part because to me that just those two passages or that uh, those three paragraphs essentially, that's Moyen to a T. <laughs> you right. have this gorgeous landscape. You feel the emotions that are, are um, being evoked by these colors and these images. And then you have these animals. He's uh, The way he depicts animals is just wonderful. And I love how he gets to their... Uh, sensibilities in that moment (laughs) but then layered on top of that you then have the gender issue as well the Mm. male drake talks in one way and he's looking at the world as if it's all just you know (laughs) just just the way it is and then there's the female going no it's actually nowhere near as good as you think it is it's (laughs) you know (laughs) that kid is awful and and it really is the only time we see uh, hey, hi, depicted in a negative light. Like, yes, he's depicted as scrawny, as monkey skinny, as, um, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the supervisor calls him all manner of names. But here's, we definitely don't get a negative picture of him as a kid. We just get the, this picture of a starving boy that, of course, any supervisor in that role would be like, oh, here's a kid on my work site, you know? So it's not right. really negative against the kid, but then you have this female duck of all things saying, no, no, it actually is. He's actually not as good as as you all think he is. And it's yeah, a bit of a foreshadowing a in a way. Yeah. Right. And I, I just love that. it's He personifies animals so well, Moyen. Um, mm. And uh, if there's any social commentary there, I think that, yeah, someone could tease that out. Right. <laughs> um. Thank you. Thank you for those couple of wee passages. I think those were nice um, compliments, the ones I did earlier. Again, coming back to yeah. like the stream and the water and mist and whatnot. Um, there's probably a lot to be said about that that we haven't even touched on. But um, mm. as much as I'd like to keep talking forever about Moatown, <laughs> Moyan, uh, Hogo and weird fiction um, and uh, synesthesia, 
we can't keep going forever. Um, but before we, we go our separate ways, I'd just like to give you a chance to direct the listeners to some further reading of any sort. So uh, if they read Radish and they enjoyed it, where else would you point them? Um, <clears throat> I would, because I started with short story collections or uh, mm. Moyen's short story collection, I would probably refer them to two other short story collections that I really, really loved. They're not Chinese, actually, mm. but they are translated. Right. Uh, let me find the title of the first one. <laughs> okay, so... One of them is called Breaking Knees, Breaking Knees, as in your kneecap, Breaking Knees, okay, good 63 title. Very Short Stories from Syria. Um, it is by Zakaria Tamir, let mm-hmm. me see if I got that name right. Yeah. Oh, Zakaria Tamir, and translated by, trying to, oh, <laughs> trying to navigate this thing. I wish I could help. Translated from Arabic by Ibrahim something. Uh, Ibrahim Muhawi. Right. So those very short stories, it's like flash fiction. They're fantastic. And then mm. um, the other one. Oh, no. Where did I read that away? one? Yes. Oh, no. Let me check my other reader. <laughs> I know I read an e copy. This is a really good collection of short stories, too, though. They're very funny. Yeah. Oh, you've got grave issues. There it is. Hey, okay. I re I read the um the preview copy. Mm-hmm. So that's why I couldn't find it. I see. You've got grave issues and what's that about? It is it okay, there it is. And that's a pun, of course, because all the stories are about they all the stories take place in a graveyard. Ah. Yeah. I've just brought it up on Amazon. Oh, you found it. That's good. Yeah. You've Got Grave Issues is a collection of short, humorous stories unified by a single theme. Everyday life in a cemetery. The events described take place in the Soviet and early post-Soviet period. The stories are observations of people whose lives are inextricably linked to the cemetery. Uh, Yada, yada, yada. Certain stories were inspired by real events. Among the characters, we find a principal journalist who finds freedom begging at the cemetery gates. An accomplished scientist whose truth calling is a service to God and other wacky characters. And that came out three years ago. It does sound very cool. It's hilarious. And so is um, Breaking Knees. Mm. Like, the, it, all the stories are also very poignant in their own ways, but they are very funny. And they are kind of of the same um, style, I would say, or at least some of the same themes and emotions that Moyen's short stories evoke as well. A lot hmm. of interesting imagery. You'll there's a little bit about ghosts. <laughs> yes. Yes, please. <laughs> and um, of course taking place in a graveyard. And hmm. the ones from Syria are also just they're mostly to do with human relationships, but still strange stuff happens, you know? Oh, that's I, life. I, <laughs> exactly. I mean there are some political stuff in there that you could talk about, but putting that aside, it's just yeah, that's just life. And hmm. There, you know, the taboo stuff is sometimes what we should talk about more. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, both of those collections are fantastic, and they're both translations. Mm. Yeah, and what are you reading uh, just now or these days? Um, at the moment, I am actually reading a book in Chinese called uh, Harbin Ren. All right. So the people of Harbin, mm. because well, one, I've had the book for a long time and just haven't had the time to read it. Mm. <laughs> and two, I one of my goals for this coming year is to just really dive in to contemporary Dongbei Wenxue. Mm. And because uh, I've started a website, a professional website, where I talk more about my research, but there's a part in it when I where I would like to do some more translations or just some more reviews of books or short stories. I really like short stories in English about these about Dongbei literature because really mm. it's not something that people talk about. Like, yeah, it's it's only becoming I shouldn't say it's only becoming anything. But among English scholars, yeah. it's just not really it's, in the it's minds. Entering the academic consciousness or something like that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I realize I've been um a little bit lax in my duties i forgot to leave a question asking for like if you've got any of your uh, platform or 
platforms or work that you'd like to promote? So I guess, first of all, what's this Dongbei Wenshui website? It sounds really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, it's called ManchuriaLiterarian.com. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and it's mostly a professional website where I share excerpts from my research and, uh, you know, conference presentations, things like that. My CV is on there for anybody who would like to hire me. <laughs> but I, I will also put more of my creative work as well, which ha also mm. has to do with Dongbei. I'm, I'm a little obsessed. <laughs> or yeah. as I like to say, I'm endlessly entertained by it. So Yeah, obsessions yeah. are the right things to chase. That's what this uh, <laughs> podcast has kind of been. And it's led yeah. to all sorts of cool things. I've just opened up the website now. It, it's lovely. It looks really nice. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. So that's, Fantastic. yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. But um, anybody can just follow me on Twitter as well if you, you know, don't want to go to the website. <laughs> and what's your Twitter handle? At Hyla Hyla 88. Okay. So just like the end of my name, H-Y-L-A, H-Y-L-A 88. Yeah. And if you're following my account, this is addressing the listeners, uh, at Angus Likes Word, it's just if you look through the replies and the mentions and the retweets, uh, Hyla will, will be in there quite recently because we've been... But going back and forth about, I think, this episode and some other things. Is that everything that you'd like to uh, promote or discuss? Is there anything really egregious we've missed? I don't think so. In that case, I'll just say thank you so much for um, for coming on the show. It's been great having you. You've taught me quite a lot about Moyan, and I'm sure it's been great for the listeners hearing about uh, Radish and Hey Hi. I hope so. And it's been such a pleasure for me to be on the show. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for just letting me um, ramble <laughs> about my all about. research and also research at large. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that was a fantastic interview. And thank you once more to Lehila Heward for being such an interesting and cheerful guest. Just a really good chat went in lots of directions I didn't expect it to, which is exactly what I want for every episode, to be honest. Uh, so yeah, what have we got left? Just the plugs, really. So first of all, if you would like to support this show materially, by which I mean with money, there's two places you can do that. One of them is Patreon. Patreon is a place where you would give a monthly contribution, and for that monthly contribution, you get something in return. So from just $1 a month or more, if you are feeling generous, you can get access to the hours of bonus content I've put up there. There is quite literally hours of cool stuff, bonus shows and whatnot on there. If you would rather just give a one-off donation, uh, you can go to the uh, Buy Me A Coffee instead. Uh, the Patreon is patreon.com slash truchofic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. Buy me a coffee is literally buymeacoffee.com slash T-R-C-H-F-I-C. There you go. That's how you can give me money. If you would like to get something for free, then good news. You can go have a look at the Trishofic map where I've put up uh, the settings and author's hometowns for every author we've covered, including Mr. Moyan and his township of Gaomi. So you'll find a link to that in the show notes. Or if you're adventurous and you'd like to type the URL into your browser, it is dustsymbols.com, sorry it's not, it's dustsymbols.tumblr.com slash truchofigmap. No spaces, no hyphens, just truchofigmap. And yeah, it's a cool thing, check it out. If you'd like to contact me, the two best places to do that are Twitter and Instagram. Twitter is a great place to DM me or spread uh, spread the word about the show by retweeting me. My Twitter handle is Angus Likes Words. That's my Twitter. If you'd like to reach out to the podcast on Instagram, the podcast has an official Instagram account. It's at Truchofic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. And um, I'd just like to plug the wee group chats that we've got going on there. So Instagram took away my power to use its very handy join chat sticker. But you can still manually make group chats and that's exactly what I've done for Moyan. I've made a Moyan group chat called Motown, um, which, you know, it's as cool as it sounds. And cool people such as me and Dylan Levi King are already there. And there already are a couple other group chats going. There's a Sanma one that I created for the episode on Stories of the Sahara. And there's a Chinese sci-fi one, which, you know, 
if you're not in there, why not? It's the coolest group chat on Instagram, period. Um, to join any of those, zap at Trichofica message and I'll be able to invite you into them. That's how that works. So yeah, uh, that is literally everything I've got to say, except of course that the best thing you can do for the show has nothing to do with sending me money or being my friend online. Those things aren't actually that important. The really important thing is spreading the word. So tell your blacksmith, tell your abusive stepmother if you have one, tell the gossiping ducks in your local stream, they'd probably like to know. Until next time, Zai Jian.